Broadcasting live from Youngville, North Carolina and Ontario, Canada, this is Got Mead Live, a weekly show where Vicki Rowe and A.J. Aramitz bring you the mead news, meadery info, and mead-making discussions from all over, talking with mead makers, mead owners, industry mavens, and influencers. This is Got Mead Live, a weekly podcast about mead and the people who love it and where the mead world is going. And now here are your hosts, Got Mead owner, Vicki Rowe, and mead and winemaker, A.J. Airmans. from the, I don't know where the hell I am, live from the den of the puppies of the apocalypse, the bunny pen in Ottawa, Canada. Um, not this week, Melbourne Down Under, because uh, Hamish has to work, um, and uh, Ryan may or may not make it, and the TARDIS in Miami, because Manny is back, yay! Welcome to Got Me Live! Welcome to the show. <laughs> yeah, we were beginning to wonder if we'd ever see you again, man. Um uh, I got on. a job. What do you want me to do? Yeah, okay, yeah, you get a job. Sorry, somehow I managed not to, un- not to unmute you guys. You're unmuted now. Uh, I'm sorry. I didn't want you to unmute. Uh, shut up, Manny. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, Manny, Manny is producing a show on their local uh, CBS, you said, affiliate? CBS, yes, CBS I think it's affiliate CBS in, in the Channel Miami 10. area. Yeah, Channel Ten in the Miami area. So if you're in the Miami area or near the Miami area, and you get that CBS affiliate, the show's called what? So Flow Health. So Flow Health, and Manny produces this. So you know, yes. it's, it's really. So cool. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you don't like it, ah, well, you know. Um, okay, so this is our last show before the AMMA conference and the Mazer Cup because we're going to take next week to get our shit together uh, because there's a lot of it and it's not going to fit in the bag. So we really need <laughs> we got to pack it really We got to really pack tight. it really tight, yeah. And there's that 50-pound limit, you know, when you go on the airlines and, yeah, it's a pain in the ass. Um, our guests tonight are Julie Lawson and Kristen England uh, from the BJCP. Julie and Chris are um, are are both involved with the BJCP uh, for both beer and mead. So uh, this is our chance to like really find out what's going on on the mead categories, on the mead on the mead uh, judging certification, and the other things that the BJCP is doing with mead. So um, this should be really interesting. And then our next guest after them tonight is Adam Crockett with Haymaker Meter, and he's speaking at the AMMA conference, and he's going to be talking about oaking your mead, but looking at some of the alternatives like can't get a barrel, you know, staves versus spirals versus cubes versus whatever. And um, so he's going to be giving a talk that's going to kind of touch on both home and pro stuff. Um, you know, it'd be, it definitely would be worthwhile for both home and pro people to look at if you're interested in oaking your mead. Um, but he's going to talk a little bit about that tonight, and we're going to get into that. And um, just to kind of give you guys an update on a little bit of what's going on, I uh, uh, drove my sorry behind all the way up to New York City this weekend from North Carolina. And um, stayed with Bob Slancy. And uh, we went to the New York Fermentation Festival at the Brooklyn Expo. And it was amazing. There were six meteries there. There was a bunch of breweries there. There was a half a dozen local clubs there. They had a band. They had, and it was a fermentation fest. So there was kimchi. There was, there was sauerkraut. There was homemade cheese. Oh my God, the cheese was so good. And wow. I got a bark. I got like a soft cheese, almost like a brie consistency, wrapped in birch bark, and it was smoked. It was. Oh I brought it God. out the next day at Bobby's house. We had some friends over, and we it just like disappeared, like poof. Um, oh yeah, it got sucked right up. And wow. um, there were six meteries there: Melavino from um, from New Jersey, and then they had eight ten Mead Works, uh, Enlightenment, uh, Salt Point. Who else was there? That was uh, there was one more. Or two more. Shoot. Now I can't remember who they were. Oh, I, I'm so embarrassed. Um, but, I mean, it was really hilarious because this was nominally, like, kind of a overall fermentation thing. The meteries were, like, six people deep all day long. I mean, they were so busy. And for those of you who may have been paying attention on Saturday, I did, like, a short 25-minute 
got me live thing from the area. My voice was already going at noon, so that's why yeah. partly why I was so short and the noise level was there that I couldn't I couldn't emote over the noise because my voice was cracking <laughs> down on me. So so it was really more kind of a test and it worked. So yeah, got me remote live works. Uh, but it was kind of cool. I was sticking microphones in people's faces, and they're like, "Who are you?" And I'm like, "Have you ever had me before?" So, <laughs> but it was it was way cool. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Bobby just uh, uh, B Nectar and Misto. Thank you, Joe. Um, were the other two. B Nectar had uh, their distributor guy who was a nut, and he was really cool there. And then Misto Mead was there as well. All the meads were really good. And we got to meet some people and some, like, uh, some alliances got formed. People got to talk to each other that hadn't before. So that was really, really cool. And we're excited. Uh, um, we're excited that, that um, you know, that that's going on. So uh, it's, 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 I think it's the beginning of, of some, some new things, you know? That's cool. Yeah, yeah. it is. Right. Joe's asking me... Uh, Joe's asking me, like, where's the chat? <laughs> Told him yeah. last time. It's like, it's here, Joe. <laughs> Come on, Joe. Pay attention, dude. Um, okay. So, um, <clears throat> anyway, um, what are we drinking? What, what are, I'm, I'm drinking water. Water? <laughs> Be, water, yes, because I have to uh, get up super early tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, no, no nothing for me. What about you, AJ? Um, I've got my friend Dave's Bachet that uh, he gave me a while ago. He made it with D47 yeast. It's around 13%, finishing gravity 1.06 or so. So it's uh, pretty nice. Uh, it's been sort of sitting in a 375 ml bottle at like one third full for you know months now, mm-hmm. since well before the whole sciatica crap kicked in. Yeah. Um, so it's starting to get that. Uh, kind of a little acrid scent to it, but the flavor seems to be pretty good still. So, cool. AJ, the bad example, telling you how not to treat your wine and then doing it anyway. And doing it anyway, yeah. And telling you what happens. Well, and there you <laughs> go. At least I'm being a good bad example. This is how we learn. <laughs> but doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bobby's pointing out there was a ton of meat networking. There really was. And then we did a group picture afterwards and then sat around and <laughs> talked shop and drank meat for like another 20, 30 minutes. And I, I, think, nice. I think stuff, you know, people connected. So it was really great. Um, and there's like a couple more meteries that are fixing to open up. Bobby's already got a lot, like nine meteries lined up for the event next year. So it's turning into a mead fest in Brooklyn, which is awesome. And, wow. Yeah, the, uh, the organizers were really happy with the way it turned out. Um, all right, so um, I'm drinking a hopped pineapple. I stopped at Brimminghorn on my way home yesterday. Got to take a ferry <laughs> ride and everything. The thing I could have gone around, but I didn't know where the mapping was taking me until I pulled up to the ferry terminal. I'm like, why am I here? <laughs> 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 you know, I don't think about how convoluted that part of the coast is. But, um, yeah, so I after the hour-and-a-half-long ferry ride, I arrived yesterday afternoon at Brimminghorn, and John Talkington was there to meet me. And I walked out of there with damn near one of everything he had, you know, which was just crazy. Um, so worth it. So, so worth it. He has some really awesome meads going on. But the one I'm drinking tonight is his hopped pineapple. And this is only on tap um, when they have it. So I got a growler and brought it home. But it's uh, hops and pineapple and honey all in the nose. And it's, it's really crisp and it's semi-sweet, so it's not too super sweet. And the hops and the pineapple kind of lead, and it's got this long, honey finish. It's almost kind of like you think, like like a light, like a like a not over hopped IPA with pineapple. Wow, that sounds really good. It is really, really good. Yeah, um, it's seriously <laughs> refreshing. Um, I got a whole growler. You can get one too. Uh, you have to go to Brimminghorn. So go to Brimminghorn Meadery in Milton, Delaware. Uh, they have a, they they have this and a number of other meads on tap. This is one of their session meads. And uh, BrimminghornMeadery.com if you need directions or want to talk to John. So, yeah, he's he's good people. Nice. So, and we got all the people are all starting to come on. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's uh, it was it was awesome. Okay, so Manny, you want to go do the? There's a scroll down. We've got a PSA for the conference, and I'm going to go ahead and bring our callers in. Okay, hold on. Let me Let's go see, I think it's find like on that the third PSA. Or fourth page or something. 
<laughs> put on your announcer okay. voice. Yeah, right. I will put on my announcer voice. <laughs> Here it comes. Opening Google Docs. Here we go. Okay. Live from the Ottawa, Canada. Live from Saturday. We d- is this the, <laughs> <laughs> Saturday Night Live. Is this the... No, that's not it. I, is, I, actually, I actually did that Saturday. I was like, live from New York. This has got me live. It was so much fun. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. Let's see. Kristen is a medical... No. <laughs> nah, nah, is it all nah. the way down? It's is probably it all, the way, all down? the way down. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, no. Maybe it's not. It looks like a... Oh, is it, sorry. Do you make amazing the, mead? Yeah, do go ahead and do that one, yeah. Okay. Here we go, everybody. Do you make amazing mead? Get in on the AMMA Mead Maker of the Year Award, spanning six competitions and collecting points for wins. Check it out and join the AMMA, join at the AMMA at, H, at uh, mead-makers.org, national-mead-maker-of-the-year-competition. <laughs> <Forward slash. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you can also just see it right on the front page of the um of the of the site too hang on i'm yeah catching. make sure you check out the, the, the links on the episode okay here. so we've got chris and we've got adam and somehow we don't have julie yet i'm not sure why um i'll try to add her again hi chris hi hi adam hello hi guys <laughs> so um Chris, Adam is uh, owner of Haymaker Meadery in PA, and uh, he's doing a talk on oak at the conference. And then, of course, uh, Adam, you probably already know that Chris is uh, with the BJCP, Chris Chris England. I do. So, yeah. I apologize and... for your Pennsylvania liquor laws. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're getting better. They're, they're getting better slowly, but uh, we're moving in the right direction. What is that? I don't know where Whoa. the hell. Pull up the high from. end, Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> what the? What are you guys doing to my? What, what are you guys doing to my radio show? Seriously. <laughs> what did I ever do to you? It. Yeah. Um. I I tried to get. I think that happened when I tried to get Julie in, and it was just like all this feedback. Um. Chris, have you got? Uh, can you text Julie and see if she's by the phone? I will send her a middle finger. Right now. <clears throat> oh, there you go. I saw one of your pictures where you were doing yeah. that. Nice silhouette, by the way. There's, there's, there's many, many of them. <laughs> that was that was the Pennsylvania Liquor Board showing that us. That was the Pennsylvania <laughs> Liquor Board. Yeah, we mentioned them. They heard us. <laughs> about right. <laughs> Sent. Pardon us if we sound a little punch drunk, guys. It's, uh, you know, AJ's working double shifts. Uh, Manny doesn't know whether he's coming or going, and I'm up to my eyeballs and alligators for the conference, so... Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's the coming to go? Yeah, yeah. The fecal matter is hitting the proverbial rotary device in all directions today, so. It is. Okay, and don't we're... forget the busted elevator. Oh, and the busted elevator in Manny's condo, yeah. <laughs> of course. Well, it is Miami. I mean, what do you, what do you really expect? I mean, yeah. Uh. A working elevator? Ah, uh, yeah, well, you know. All right, we're, I'm going to try third, to get Julie at it again. We'll see if this works It's such a third time. world problem. I know, Oh, right? my God. <laughs> like, how can you not have a working elevator? Yeah. Chris, did you see where I dropped you the link to the live chat? Uh, on... Check your, check your, the... uh, yeah, check your, um, um, Facebook. If you're not, if you're Facebook. not logged into it, but I, or Facebook, I'm sorry, uh, Skype. Um, Yeah. <laughs> when meat attacks. <laughs> Good when one, meat Bob. attacks. <laughs> Bobby says when meat attacks. Yeah, that's it too. Yeah. So don't piss it off. This is what happens. Okay. Right. That's when you don't when you don't uh, degas before adding nutrients. Okay. Well, we're. Gonna oh, that's go ahead definitely and... a meat attack. <laughs> we're gonna go ahead and get things going, and I imagine at some point we'll manage to get Julie in here. I haven't. I, I tried to add her a couple of times, and it doesn't seem to be working. Um. But. Uh, I think I have the right number for her. I don't know. They use one less number in Iowa. One less number than you? <laughs> yeah, I got 9295170254. Is that right? Sounds, sounds familiar. Okay. Well, I don't know what the heck. 
Oh, did I leave it on the wrong one? I'm sorry. I added it to your phone thing. Sorry, dude. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> there we are. What link? He's like, what link, dude? Um, okay. All right. So, uh, blah. BJCP. Uh, t- Chris, tell us, tell, for those of you, who, for those of our listeners who don't know who you are, um, kind of give them the rundown. Jesus Christ. <laughs> How long dude, we got? I saw like a five-page <laughs> article about you. That was where I got your bio. <laughs> Uh, I've done stuff. Been there, done that. He's um, a doctor, guys. <laughs> so, Ooh. in my life before beer and mead stuff, I was got my PhD in pharmacology from the University of Minnesota, uh, okay. and then they like hosing people there when it comes to paying them like a living wage, and we had a, a freeze, kind of a moratorium on wages for a while. So, a buddy and I started a brewery. And it's been amazing ever since. Cool. More or less, yeah. More or less. So the BGCP stuff, yeah. We just, just enjoy. I, it, I got in the education part, the beer and mead, because um, I was so upset when I learned the vast majority of things that were taught to me when I first started were so entirely wrong. <laughs> that people were just re, they were just regurgitating all this shit that, that was wrong to begin with. Yeah. Is this a show we can swear on or can't yes, swear? Yes, it is. It is an explicit show. Knock yourself out. Uh, excellent. <laughs> Yeah, so it was, you know, it just absolutely infuriated me that, that and when I brought it up to the people that, that were teaching, they said, well, you know, well, you basically, you know, buyer beware, you should have known this. And I, I just trusted them to, you know, put as much diligence in as I would. And so then I just started writing all my own stuff. And then I got to be working with the BGCP and providing a whole lot of stuff for them and working together. And basically, I'm an enemy of things that are wrong and people are, that are full of shit. <laughs> um, I, I, I wake up every day thinking that I don't know half as much as I think I do and, and I try to learn something from everyone no matter how annoying they are and and we, we go from there and if we can all teach each other no matter how kumbaya that sounds and try to put the egos aside which mine is extremely small um, it will be better off I think especially when it comes to things like me because uh, the world, the, the world is kind of just getting their taste of mead, and there's already, you know, commercial mead makers out there doing their best to make a buck and absolutely kill, absolutely killing people's interest in mead. You know, that's a completely different story. So. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, there's a little bit, but it's a new, it's a new world, so to speak, at least from a formalized perspective. Um, mm-hmm. you know, cause we've all been out there doing this for a long time, but now we're starting to organize, you know, so, um, the mean yeah. union, you know, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, here's, but the same, the, the same issue comes up with every single union, right? You get, you get the people that really want to do stuff. They're going to push it ahead and you get mm-hmm. the people that want to make money. They're going to bitch about stuff. And then you get the people kind of stuck in the middle who really want to do well, but don't have, don't have the finances, right? Not everybody has the ability to get one of these fantastic sterile filters that they can pound the piss out of their mead, run it through in two weeks, oxygenate, get out of it and charge, charge $25 for a, for a split and tell everybody how wonderful it is. Yeah. This poor guy in the middle is like, but, but my stuff's fantastic. And there's a little sludge on the bottom because, you know, I can't get it out because I don't have the multi, multi, multi million dollars or multi, multi dollars that that you have, and your stuff is absolutely piss poor, and you're charging so much for it. Yeah. You know, and not just not, I. I have no issue at all with people charging what they charge for it. The issue becomes is when the, the general public doesn't know much about mead, and and you pour somebody a mead that that or beer for that matter doesn't really matter that's mediocre at best, and you tell them this is the best mead you'll ever try, and they're like, oh well, thank you. Um, I'm not going to buy one. It's twenty five dollars a split. <laughs> So right, right there. Instead of saying this is good, this is the best ever, you know. So, so uh, the biggest issue that I see right now is is this, this public that doesn't know what they doesn't doesn't understand the concepts even that are getting pushed down the throats by by the the larger series of the marketing departments that have it, telling that this meat is amazing. And then when you ask these meat makers, hey, uh, you know, you're doing great. You're selling this stuff all over. How are your follow up sales? You know, and and they kind of poo poo that. Yeah, they and do. And I'm talking to a few people. They, they always do. And I'm talking to a few people out in California and, and th- that are fantastic mead, booze, beer people. And they say, you know, they, th- that work for, for these distributors. And they're like, we, we try to sell it and we try to be there, but we tell these places that they need to have boots on the ground to be able to sell this stuff. Because they'll go, they'll do a sampling. It'll go crazy because everybody wants to sample mead. You know how the hell it is. You go to a beer festival, there's a mead stand. You go to a mead festival, a beer stand. 
whatever's the different one is going to go crazy. And these people just want to sit and they're like, this is fantastic. I haven't had this before. This is amazing. And as soon as those people go away and it's sitting on the shelf, six months later, you know, it's coded out and it's sitting in the, it's sitting in the discount line. And let alone, let alone will that liquor store never buy mead from you again. These people, if they do pick it up, it's going to be something that's, that's super old. And frankly, as I said before, the way most of these people treat, treat mead, even if you, even if you have your sulfates and everything there, and you're going to have an issue with, with oxidation and you're selling people old brick mead for a, for a high price, it's, it kills all of us, which, which makes my job in the BCP even more important to talk to the people that are learning to judge mead, to show them what they should be uh, looking for, what they should be expecting, that they should say, no, 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 we will not accept this, this flawed mead, we will not accept this, this poor quality mead, regardless of the cost. You know, because mead's expensive. I mean, there's no getting around it, honey. But, yeah. And, yeah. It, it, and, and uh, that's fine. I mean, good booze is expensive. You, you know, this is not this is not a product that, that you're going to, that the general person is going to buy just because it's so freaking expensive. I mean, comparatively. So the, our, our goal, or my goal specifically, is to ensure that people understand what they're, what they're buying, you know, where this comes from, what it is, and, and what, what a good one over a bad one is. And, and I could tell you one out of every probably 20 people that make mead actually make, you know, what I would consider good mead, and I'm not saying good to my taste. It's just things that aren't flawed. Yeah. Because there's so much information out there that's entirely wrong, right? You can read a book. They're like, okay, I did it. And somebody's will taste it. They're like, wow, this is the best mead I've ever had. And you're like, oh, have you ever had meat before? Like, no, but it's not disgusting. But it's the best, like I thought yeah. they would be. Oh, we got, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's we finally crazy. got Julie in. I had a typo in, num- in the number. I'm sorry, Julie. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry I about that. Yeah, I looked and it said, oh, no, 920. Yep, I'm oh, sorry about oh, that. Oh, okay, okay. Well, it's nice to know it wasn't me because I'm making enough mistakes lately. I don't need any more. <laughs> 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 all right, so uh, for all y'all who are wondering what the hell, this is Julie Lawson. Julie Lawson is also with the BJCP, and I should have had her in here earlier, but I typed her number in wrong. So, anyway, welcome. To got me live, Julie. Well, thank um, you, thank you. Yeah, Kristen's been off on a rant about uh, quality, <laughs> <laughs> but um, and and a good rant it is because um, you know one of the things that I've noticed, and I've been out there looking at mead and trying mead and documenting mead for two plus decades now, and what I see is a lot of people going, "Our mead is the best in the world," and it's like, and I go taste it, and I'm going, and what do you base that on? Because it's yeah, what I've noticed is anybody who has to say that usually is wrong. You know, yeah. if they're yeah, saying wrong. that, that's they're wrong. probably wrong. You know, I mean, it's because the ones that are the real best, they don't say anything. They don't have to. You're wrong. I am the best lover you've never met. <laughs> <laughs> I've met you in a bar, and somewhere. I will say that till the day I die. <laughs> does, does your wife know you're hitting bars? <laughs> <laughs> I have a tendency not to hit most things. Yeah, <laughs> I'm married. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but that was qualified by most things. <laughs> yeah. Bob Slance's comment. There's usually, should... there's usually, yeah. A, Go ahead. Like, quotes around most things, I think. Yeah. Every contract <laughs> has wiggle room, including marriage contracts. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, Bobby is saying we should all be trying to make the best, and I agree wholeheartedly. Unfortunately, and this is where the problem is, and at least I don't know if it's, just, if it's as true in the beer world, uh, I don't make beer i drink it but i don't make it um is that the preponderance i mean it seems like the vast majority of information that's out there about mead is like flat out wrong and uh, so so we get noobs coming in and they're like well i boiled it for an hour and a half and then i added the acid blend and the and the, yeah. and the irish moss and i don't understand why it tastes like shit you know and and so <laughs> you know so so they don't but they don't know that that's wrong because they don't know what they don't know and so so well, di- I mean, directing them to good for the... information, you know, is is the big thing. Well, you just gave the perfect recipe for a boche, so I mean, we're go- you're good to go there. If well, you, if you, boil... perfectly, you got the best. If you added the water, it's so not. Fun. You know, if you're boiling the water this... and the honey, if you're just boiling <laughs> the honey, yes. But I, I don't think this boche that I'm drinking actually needed acid blend, and, pr- and I don't think the guy that made it put any in because he's yeah. a beer brewer by. Oh. But you go look I'm at the scared. you go look at the books that were out there when I got started. Mm. We had Acton and Duncan. We had Morse. And that was it. And, and the Bible. Uh, Those and, are the three books. Well, you had. and the Bible, which doesn't really go into anything <laughs> about acid blend. But uh, <laughs> you know. But Acton and Morton, they, they, Acton and Duncan sure loved their acid blend. Oh yes, they did. Because that's the way they made yeah. wine then. 
You know, and that's what right. they were working from was this is how they make wine, so therefore – this being honey wine, it, the same process applies. And the funny thing is, is that's really actually quite true that much the same process does in fact apply, but there are notable exceptions based on the composition of honey. Like things like the kind of nutrients we have to add because there ain't no, you know, the, you know, there's no right. nitrogen in honey. So, you know, that's... You know, that's the kind of thing. So, and, and that's what, you know, I mean, that's why I love what's starting to happen. We're seeing groups that are dedicated to accurate information. The BJCP, my God, the, the collection of study information you guys have got for the certification, I send people there all the time going, learn this first. You don't have to certify this, but this pile of information, I mean, you can if you want to, but this pile of information is great. And it links you out to other good piles of information which are also great, you know? Right. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah, exactly. You don't even know what questions right. to ask. So it's 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 really, right. yeah, it's frustrating, you know, for those that are out there teaching because all the noobs are kind of, well, and the other thing that I'm running into, and I'm sure you guys are seeing this, is the instant gratification uh, thing that has become the thing since social media. You oh, know, gosh, I, yeah. Well, you mix you mix stuff together with enough fruit in it, and you filter the piss out of it, and then you're like you put it on you put it on you know the Facebook and you and you bottle up 400 bottles of it, and you put it underneath your uh, underneath your house or on the moon or where the shit ever. You're like, ooh, I made the best meat ever. Like, holy shit, you know? Can we just focus on what you did and how you did it, and let's let's share it and instead of these like wank pics of every single thing. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like dick pics of mead, you know. <laughs> You need is that to, my, you need is to that my loud voice? I'm sorry, I thought it was muted. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, not sorry. <laughs> no, no, enunci- enunciate mead. Make sure you put a D on the end of that. Yeah, mead. right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I don't know how many times it's... What do you mean, meat? No, no, yeah, meat. Exactly. Oh, my God, yeah, yeah I know. So much so that... So much... While I was booking my flight to, to Mazer Cup. You make meat? Ugh, honestly. No, yeah. cows meat. make meat. I eat meat, but I drink mead, you know. How do you make meat? Seriously. Yeah. Cows make meat. Pigs make grow meat. Cow. That's not... you know. <laughs> Carefully? <laughs> well, unless you're making that uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that miracle burger. Have you, have you seen this thing? It's vegetable meat that's supposed to actually be like meat and bleed and everything. Oh, That's kind of disturbing. <laughs> they, they, actually. The, the vegans do understand that when we eat meat, blood's not pouring out of it, right? No, no, blood is pouring out of it. Uh, of course, it that's what I'm be, saying. Yeah. I just don't think. Just when I eat a steak, Jim, right? Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. If it's well done, I'm sorry, I can't be friends with you anymore. Um, right. By yeah. the way, I, I just posted a dick pic to the chat. I saw oh, that. Thanks for that. Man. Nice dick pic. Yeah, that's a really good dick pic, actually. That was before they artificially aged in the animatronics. Um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. I've long believed that 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 he was an anim- audio animatronic and not actually real. Um, okay, so so what's going on? And we got Julie here too. All right, so Julie, now that we've got Kristen wound down a little bit and got the edge off of him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a fun show. I can see it now. Um, tell us a little bit of, you know, tell them, because I already know you sent me a bio. Um, tell the rest of these guys a little bit about yourself and how you got involved with the BJCP. Oh, gosh, you know, it's probably a seam old story everybody else has. I started, um, actually, I switched from a, you know, fuzzy yellow drinker of beer to craft beer, and uh, we got interested in brewing. Somebody gave me one of those Mr. Beer kits that sat in my closet and hardened, and then, I just said I wanted to start brewing beer, and I was just doing it less than a year and thought, ah, you know, I'm not getting enough. I was not getting the information. And like you were saying, there's not a lot of good resources out there. So uh, there was an area that was offering the beer judging program. So I thought, well, I'm going to take that. And once I took that, I got hooked. And ever since then, I'm really into the education piece. I'm always trying to learn things. Um, you know, I, I look out there and the resources really are not great. Uh, online, people can say anything. There's people who believe it and say, well, online they told me to do this. Mm. And I thought I wanted to become more involved and, you know, get some good resources out there and also reach people who not everybody has groups and clubs they can go to or people who are experts. Um, you know, that's another reason why I started the judging because it's like, well, these people know what they're talking about rather than, 
you know, uh, another person said, oh, this is really good when it really is not good. It really sucks. And so that's kind of how I got started. And it's kind of has snowballed. And that's pretty much what I do for my hobby and my vacations is beer and mead and all type of alcohol-related activities. Nice. As they, as they should judging be. it makes it seem a little bit, yeah it makes it seem a little bit uh, more acceptable when I say well I'm a judge I'm I'm drinking for education not just for fun yeah <laughs> just all my my whole fucking business well and it, why it, why are you sitting next to me yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it, it'll it, like it go elsewhere it can be fun too because uh, you know you get these looks when you go to wineries breweries meteries whatever and if they don't know you which with meteries they all know me so I can't get away with this but. It works great in wineries, and I'll sit there, and, I, and and since I've become a judge, and I've complained about this a few times, I I analyze the fuck out of everything. <laughs> it's like yep. so, so I'm yes. like I'm like drinking water and going, it's a little minerally. Do you have an artesian well? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm like a burger. I, I I got I got a I got a, I got a new. They've got this uh, bacon smoked mushroom burger at Wendy's, and I picked one up. I was starving one day. Decided to do a Wendy's, so I saw that. I was like, Oh, I like mushrooms. I'll get that. And so I'm at home eating it, going, Well, the mushrooms are really quite smoky. I like that, and the Asiago cheese really sets it. It's like it's a freaking <laughs> Wendy's burger for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it makes me crazy. But I go to like a winery now, and so I'm sitting and I'm swirling, and I'm and I'm um, you know, in the glass, and I'm smelling it, you know, and then I'm swirling it in my mouth, and I'm doing the little blow the air through your mouth thing to get air over your palate, and and they're looking at me like I grew a second head, because <laughs> tourists don't do that. <laughs> it's just it just cracks me up, and they're like what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm a, I'm a wine judge and I can't help myself. This is the way I do it. I just, you know, deal, <laughs> you know? So yeah, it's, it, it just, it cracks me up because now I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm trapped in this hell of having to analyze everything. I can't just enjoy it. I have to like pick it apart. How do you People wonder why you're holding it up to the light? Do what? Mm-hmm. Oh, I was saying people wonder why you're holding your, your beer up to the light or your wine or the oh, meat yeah. up to the light and examining it. There's why you get picky about glassware, you know, and I try to be polite, but it's like, don't give me a frosted mug with anything. And, um, you know, I've gotten to the point where, you know, I don't want it. I'm going to tell them that. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. And, you know, it's like, it's like is it supposed to be cloudy? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes you get a dirty look. (laughs) (laughs) Then when you start asking them interesting questions that they never get asked. So, so what temperature are you guys fermenting this is at? Because I'm getting these, these, you know, flavors of blah, blah, and blah. And they're looking at you like, really? Who are you? (laughs) Can't you just like drink the stuff and buy a case and get the hell out of my space? There are other people trying to taste here. (laughs) <laughs> it's crazy. Meteries, un- yeah. Meteries understand. Meteries get it. Yeah, they do. Um, but yeah, they're they're used to us, you know. But and and I can get away with just about anything in a meadery that's not illegal or that will disrupt their business, you know. But um, you know, so yeah, they put up with my shit. But <laughs> <laughs> but um, so what are you guys? What are you guys doing then with specifically with meat? Since this is kind of a meat show at the BJCP. Hello. Go ahead, Julie. Oh. <laughs> They're both waiting okay. for the other one to start. <laughs> no, no, no. I have a tendency to talk all day, so I have to yell at Julie. <laughs> There's your well, word we in have the meat program. And, you know, the meat program really is, I guess I want to say it's really not new because it has been around for a while. Um, actually, I think, I think since 2008, they, um, uh, that was back in St. Paul, Minnesota. They kind of trialed it they felt there was a need for meat judges. You could have a lot of beer judges, you could have high-ranking beer judges, but it never really meant that these judges knew meat. And uh, you'd have organizations where people were submitting meat, they want good feedback, we want to evaluate those meats good, and they thought, oh, you know, we got to do something about that. So that program did stem from that. And since then, it has undergone some uh, some revisions, and uh, I think the last revision was around 2015, and it is what it is now. Okay. And the purpose is to educate 
existing beer judges or even those who are not beer judges as to evaluating need. Because okay. it really is about, you know, the knowledge, knowing what's going on with that. So, are so, you... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I have many questions. Uh, <laughs> I was talking to Andrew this weekend because he was at the um, Firm Fest in New York. And um, we got to chatting over a glass. And um, we were talking about, like, what is involved with adding new categories? Because we see now what we're seeing is that the what we call weirdamels in the industry, but are other officially in the BJCP. Um, but things like capsicumels, so pepper meads, are a huge category now. We're seeing a lot of um, oh god, what are a couple of the other ones that we're getting tons and tons and tons of these days? There's just there's okay. a lot. Yeah, thank you, Boche. Um, you know, so there's categories that are that could be categories, but are really just sort of taking over that other area, and really, it's getting really so that's like almost the biggest category is the everything else category. So what's yeah, it's kind with... of a tough one. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. You know, we can't. Oh, you know, go ahead, do it. Stop doing it. Actual... I mean. <laughs> I, I, and Chris would probably know this better than I do, but, you know, it, the catch-all kind of a lot of times is a specialty need. It's hard to know when to create a new category. They don't uh, update the guidelines constantly. Some stuff comes and it goes, um, like the black IP is an example of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I know it seems like in the competition, the spice, herb, and vegetable seems to be one of the bigger categories. Yeah, it is. And a lot of the stuff ends up in there. I actually, that's one of my favorite categories to do. I know you can get some really odd things, but I really like doing that category. Um, but really, that's one of the few places we have to put some of those yeah. different type of moves that are coming up right now. Can people but propose it, you know, the, new categories? Sure. Okay. Yeah, it, it's they're going to be great. All right, so y'all heard it here first, but you better make sure that you are at least as thorough as the BJCP is in their descriptions. Oh, man, you go ahead and send them. You go ahead and send them right to me. There you go. Send them to no Chris No problem Samples at all. all. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> Kristen at BJCP.org. Send them away. There you and go. you can tell me exactly why your, your, your fancy hot new mead with chili peppers in it is going to need to be its own little style. <laughs> We, uh, because you know what, I saw it on I saw it on Instagram, and I can eat more hot peppers than you because my dong is bigger, and this is going to be amazing. <laughs> it's so hot you can't even feel your face. It's, <laughs> woo! Yeah, it's going to be great. Yeah, let's make that a category. Amazing. And then what about next? What about next week when you find something else that that fits your fancy? Yeah, we can actually, do that too. Actually, at least as far as capsicumels go, pepper meads, um, that category has been growing. I was one of the people that helped found the Mazer Cup. And that category has been picking up speed and growing faster and faster every single year since the first one happened, which was probably eight, nine years ago. And, um, I mean, every year there's more and more and more of them. And now the meaderies are starting to all produce pepper mead, so it's getting mm -hmm. big. It's getting really big, and it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Um, yeah, there's a lot of other ones that are kind of flashing the pants, but this one and Boucher's are two that are just going nuts, and both home and so, commercially. So for so oh, for your capsicumel, this is an easier one. So capsicumel, you're just pe hot peppers, right, of any sort. Pretty much, yeah, hot peppers of any sort. And, right. and you know, I mean, There's, it's a fairly easy description. Here there. Yeah, what what needs to be said is things about balance and stuff like that, because I can't tell you how many yep. I've tried that burn your face off oh, as soon gosh, as the yeah. first sip. You know, it's like, <laughs> all right, no. I had a ghost pepper one from Bobby. I tasted it, and it was good. I, I don't do hot, hot peppers. I'm like a Chipotle girl. You know, that's that's as high as my level goes uh, when I'm eating the peppers. And, um, you know, th that ghost pepper mead was so well balanced. So, yeah, yeah that's I mean, the issue with these with these hot pepper meads is that it's a fourth dimension. I mean, people have a hard enough time doing doing the three standard dimensions. They throw a fourth <laughs> dimension and, and they, they try to use one of they try to use the spice as one of the three for balancing. And that never, ever, ever works ever. Right, uh, it's it's the silliest thing. It's like I'm going to make this mead, and then I'm going to throw hot peppers into it, rather than planning. This is going to be another component completely in this mead, rather than I made this mead now peppers are going to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you're right. I mean, that's the thing is they're they're looking at it as an adjunct rather than as an integral part of the recipe. 
And it um, is. It, it is four. It is now four components you have to play with because if your acid is anywhere near remotely high, if your tannins are anywhere near remotely high, and you put peppers in there, it, it's it's just going to throw the thing completely out of whack. And, and the choice of your peppers, you know, and it's you know, and it'll, you know, the same thing too is that when you get to something like or something that's higher on the Scoville scale that'll just melt your face. Where do you get the character of that specific pepper, right? The Bootjolakia. Where do you get the character of that pepper other than it keeps elephants away? I mean, <laughs> literally, <laughs> that's what that pepper was for, right? I absolutely love fresh pepper character, and you know, and I love spice and meat, but it has to be part of the component. It's just you know, and the vast majority of them are not. There's either zero pepper, or you know, there's or there's way too much. And the biggest problem you get is. If you think there's an issue with people not being able to understand the concept of sweetness, you want to talk about people not understanding the concept of heat. My buddy, Booz and Susan Rude, you sit her down and you give her something that's got hot peppers in it, she will look, you look at her and she is way more pink than normal. And yeah. she will say it is the hottest thing, <laughs> hottest thing she's ever had. This is ridiculous. And I'm sipping it going, there's no heat in this. Yes, it is. It's crazy. It's, <laughs> that sounds like so, me. So let alone, oh, it's, it, it's it's really hard it's really hard for for judges too right if somebody makes a fantastic mead and with with peppers and and they really think it's well balanced because you know you're balancing their heat in their own palate and they truly to their palate there's it's not, it's got hardly any spice at all and then you throw it into you throw it into a, a competition and you enter it and all of a sudden somebody's like this is stupid and you can't even drink this you know as an entrant how do you how how how, how do you take that. And as a judge, how am I supposed to tell somebody, you don't like hot peppers, you really need to listen to somebody say, is this completely thrown out of balance? Which is, which is kind of like a, 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 a way, especially in, in meads, teamwork needs to work. You know, if people can't taste butter and somebody tells you, hey, dude, there's a ton of butter in this beer, you're like, okay, I will take, I will take your word for it. Same thing when somebody says, this is way out of balance, this is way too hot. And everybody else is like, this is fantastic, what are you talking about? Right? I mean, so that's what you have to learn as a judge, too, you know. It... it, it it's much more, you know, conversational judging style than, than what did you get? What did I get? Okay. This is super hot. I didn't think so. You know, 32, there it goes. Well, the question, and then again, the question isn't, is it hot? It's, is it balanced? Because like I say, I, I, I perceive hot totally differently than, than my pepperhead friends, but I could perceive balance. I know what that's like. And, uh, you know, this, this one I had from Bobby is ghost pepper. I told him the whole time, I don't like ghost pepper, Bobby. I'm not going to try that, Bobby. It's, it, I don't like hot things like that, Bobby. I don't want to try it. Bobby shoves it under my face and says, drink this. And so I tasted it, and, and I'm like, oh, that's really nice. He's like, that's the ghost pepper. I'm like, oh, because I could taste the peppers. And they were really sure. interesting, but they weren't, like, melting my face off, which is what a ghost pepper would do if I ate one in food or by itself, you know, um, or in and out of balanced meat, which I've had one of those, too. <laughs> and, and well, and another reason why I'd like to personally see that be its own category, aside from the fact that it's growing like mad, is that being uh, grouped together with so many other things, if it turns up in a flight, you can totally destroy your palate for the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah, you know that's just, that's if you're an asshole, right? If, if you're a, if the head judge at the table doesn't have to pre-order everything for people, but he just goes down and list says, "Listen, everyone, we're saving all the hot pepper stuff to the end." That's all they have to do, and uh, because yeah, I've been sitting on I've, I've been sitting on flights when I've said that and turn around and watch some ass hat just just pour something and start drinking it, and somebody's like, "Wow, this is this is extremely hot habanero." And you're like, why the hell are you drinking that? And they're like, well, you know, I just really wanted to try it. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. You're a horrible judge. Yeah. You should be yelled at every well, and, day and for the being head a judge stupid should, human being. Yeah, the head judge should sort them, <laughs> so the pepper's at the end. But I've judged like two, three flights of Weirdamels, the other category. Yeah. And, and, and had yeah. two or three peppers in there, and you push them out to the end, but then there's flight number two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, you know? it happens, though. Yeah, right? three so, glasses I mean, of water before flight number two. Yeah, and a glass of milk. We're talking something completely different now. We're talking, you know, the, the ability of the palate to handle the amount of capsaicin on your tongue, right? I mean, yeah. there's nothing you can do about that. No, no, but again, a balanced mead isn't going to rip your face off. It isn't going to drop a shitload of uh, capsaicin onto your tongue because it's balanced. Well, it could, yeah, but, but if you're you going to like you it have, anyway. It, it's bacon fat, is what it is. You keep fat. eating. You keep. You think if you think ice cream and bacon is good, once you taste it, it tastes like absolute shit because you can't get that bacon fat off your tongue. 
And the same thing with capsaicin. Capsaicin is, is an oil, and you can't get that off your tongue no matter what. So you have it's just cake on cake. You have one, and you have another. Then twelve later, you're like, oh, uh, you know, well, your I can't palate's taste getting anymore. Over. Yeah, it's overloaded. Yeah, just, be, just because you just keep pouring them down your gullet, and then by that time, fuck it, bring on, bring on, bring on the the the, the, the you know high life because I need to wash this shit out of my mouth. <laughs> mm. <sighs> it's time for the fortified meads. I need something to settle me down. <laughs> <laughs> so, I need to get back to zero. I need adult pain. Yeah. <laughs> Milk mead time. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's right. And, I mean, and then always you, follow it with a milk and then you, meat. <laughs> God, see, you know the, the way you people talk. Shouldn't you be calling it a milk mel or something stupid like no, that? No, we you haven't given it a name. Well, lacto lacto mel is what they call them. Lacto mels, yeah. Lacto ovo mel for the people that are. Yeah, no, that's if you put but... eggs in it. That's if you use like egg whites to yes, clear I got, it. Then yes. it's a lacto ovo mel, you know. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so I mean, that's just just the physical human inability to deal with capsaicin, which is, which is the plant saying, fuck off, don't eat me or you'll die. Yeah, yeah right? it is. I mean, that's, and here that's, we are, stupid humans, idea. eating them anyway and daring each other to eat right. more of them. Yeah. Right. I mean, like I, I'm telling you, the Bujolaki and stuff were made and, and they're, they're used to keep elephants away. Like, Google it. It's crazy. They make these <laughs> little bombs and stuff to, to blow up and keep these elephants from coming and destroying these people's crops. It wasn't like, hey, this is going to be fantastic. Let's put four or five of these in this bitch, and it's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> Jaden, Jaden's on the live chat going, oh, my God, you need to have this guy on all the time. He's he's great. <laughs> You're cracking him up over there in Western Canada, Chris. <laughs> he's Canadian? Sorry, Jaden. <laughs> yeah, so is, he, is, he, is, he so is AJ. AJ lives in Ontario. <laughs> is it Nunavut? Ontario's, yeah, Ontario's east. I thought he was, like, Western. No, no, J- yeah, or... no, AJ, AJ, so who's I'm in, uh, uh, one of the hosts, she's in Ontario. Jaden's on the yeah. chat, and he's over, he's over in Western oh, okay. Canada. Yeah. yeah and I believe it's pronounced East. Ottawa. I don't know, is ask AJ, she Ottawa? lives there. Only by certain newscasters, Ottawa. Yeah, no, it's Ottawa. Ottawa. See? Ottawa, it's like, like she said, I believe her. Toronto versus Toronto, you know. Yeah, I, I usually say Toronto just because I speak really fast. Mm. Notice that, and I don't have time for extra syllables. <laughs> so yeah, so so you brought up the, the caps, the 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 capsicum L or whatever the hell you guys are calling it, and then then you have the boche, which is my absolutely most loved thing to talk about. It is oh, I love talking about boche. Oh, they're oh no, they're they're the most fun because I ask somebody to define one, and they sit there and they stare at me, they're like no, 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 define one. Or like I heat honey, how much? What, 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 right? So, when you're defending Boucher's, you're talking about cooking. So, first of all, the entire concept of this bullshit history, like one reference, kind of, from what, the 12th century? In some book that was written backwards, script, and front to back? Yeah. It, it, it's, there is it's... no history of this. It's, it's a fucking made-up style, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with making some shit up. It's great. However, if you're going to make the shit up, and you're like, Boucher's is the best, so if I put honey in a pot and turn the heat on and turn it right back off, that's a boche. If I took it and clean, took the piss out of it until it turns to molasses, that's a boche. So it's like, hey, this is a boat. You see things in competitions like, I made this boche with this, that, and the other. And you taste it, and people, and people ask me, like, do you think this is boche enough? And I, and I tell them, I, I can't tell you if this is boche enough. Is it a good mead? Right? Is this a good mead? Does this balance? It's, it's extremely difficult to talk about something that has zero parameters. Yeah. Right? Because of Boucher. It's cooked, honey. How, do you, how, how much? That's the first thing you ask, and the, and the next answer is some. <laughs> Till right? it was done. Some, somehow. <laughs> right? You cook it. Because if you had something, we, you cook it at least to the softball stage, right? You cook it at least to this temperature. You cook it to this. You cook it. You know, and people's infatuation with goddamn white plates. And oh, putting a little oh my of honey God, yeah, I know, that cracks me up. It's like, look how dark I got it. Look at where it was at five minutes and six minutes and seven minutes. Well, I mean, and oh. there's a whole other dimension, too, is like, are you cooking it on the stove? Are you cooking it in a pressure cooker? Are you doing a slow cooker? That's all going to bring out different It's results. going to be amazing. I'm going to use my Instapot and the seven other hipster things I have to make. Hey, hey, I have one of those. I have two of those, things. actually. They're great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a fucking pressure cooker. <laughs> It it's is a, a fucking pressure, pressure cooker. That's what the it's fuck a, it is. But it's an automatic one that I don't have to stand there and watch. You know, I can walk away. That's I fine. Like that. <laughs> but when people say, hey, yeah. I Googled a recipe for Instapot. No, you Google fucking pressure cooker recipe. Pressure That's cooker recipe, which is the same it's, thing, it's just, yeah. Yes, absolutely right. Absolutely right. And you'll have somebody say, it does so much more. 
I'm like, well, this it does. is not the state fair. Yeah. It, yes, it does. But it's a fucking pressure cooker. Yeah, no, it is. Back yeah. to Boucher's, <laughs> they make about as much sense, right? So you take the best parts of the honey, right? The best parts, the aroma, especially, let's talk monofloral. You take monofloral honey and you're like, oh, you, the best part of it is that beautiful aroma. And then you cook the shit out of it. Now you don't have that. Yeah, because all that stuff got driven off in the cooking. Well, yeah, you know, I do understand that the better honey you use, even if you push a lot of the aromas, the, the more volatile aromas off, you're going to have some changes to some really cool stuff, and you absolutely will develop some really, really cool aromas. I, I get that, but when you're using really, really top-end stuff, you know, it doesn't make sense to me to do that. Then at the other side, somebody's like, dude, you know you can spend $1.50 a pound if you go down to Sam's Club, you get, you know, you get the gut-wrenching, you know, bee squirts or the Turkish honey, which people still don't understand is from bugs. That this is this is fantastic, right? It's like I think it's to me to me truly to make a, to economically speaking and for my own personal soul that if you picked a honey that was moderately priced and and cooked it almost like you're making candy, so you get almost that kind of maybe toasted marshmallow character out of it, then you have a palate to play with whatever you want to do. And then instead of calling it like this has to be a category, this is a fantastic fucking thing I just made, and what do you think? rather than, I don't think it's dark enough. Because I shit you not, I've had a master judge say that to me. Saying, oh, what do you think? I don't think this is dark enough for a boche. And I just really wanted to just pick them up, but I couldn't because, of course, they were obese uh, and throw them. Well, I mean, it's like, <laughs> and, and, and who's, I, I don't remember there being a rule laid down about how dark is dark enough. No, there's not. There's yeah. not, but people assume these things, right? It's cooked honey, so automatically people are like, oh. Yeah. I mean, it's everybody does it, it different. There used I mean, to be a temperature range. I remember hearing a temperature range for it too. I don't remember what it was, well, but they said, "Well, it can't get this high. It's got to be here." And which is great in a know. pot, but if you're doing it in a pressure cooker, it's a whole different thing. So that's the thing: is setting up a standard like that, and that's where if mm -hmm. there if, and this is a big if, um, there was ever to be a category created around it, um, we'd have to establish some parameters. And they're and they're going to be bullshit made up ones, right? Except of course they, they are. They, yeah, they will be, they will be decided. But they'll be official right? BJCP so, bullshit made up ones, so, so it's all right. No, <laughs> slow down. I didn't say that. I didn't say that at all. I said no. I did. <laughs> no, but you're right. I mean, we just have to. I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't have to have. It doesn't have to have a. Um, you know, a reference in history necessarily. It's just that this all. this is a this is a style that has developed, and here are the style guidelines that have been developed around it. You know, I mean, yes, absolutely. I, yes, I, I agree completely. Yeah. Because to me, I, I see two types of boche truly. I see the the highly cooked ones, and I see the lesser cooked ones. I don't like the highly just, cooked ones. It, they taste burnt. <laughs> yeah, they taste like shit. Yeah, but. What I'm saying, some people just really believe that to make their their mediocre Russian Imperial Stout, they need to throw this burnt honey into it. Yeah. Uh, I, either way. Perfectly. We it, <laughs> putting it two, putting it putting it two, and having okay, this is this is a dark one, and basically this is not a proposal. I'm just saying this is a dark one, and this is a light one, and the light ones you would expect this, the dark ones you'd expect this, and you would also expect a little bit of the little bit of the 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 character of the honey. Mm -hmm. Like for individual monofloral or whatever, right? It, if you make it, if you make it wide open, and and limit the parameters to be very very specific, being lighter tasting and heavier tasting, I mean you're gonna be you're gonna you, I think you'd be much better off. The yeah. issue becomes is that once you start teaching people that, then you'll get the people you'll get the people like the Michael Wilcoxes of the world who who, who will take who, who will who will know that, that exact thing and just use like say maybe 25% of the cooked honey and then 75% of, of non-cooked honey and blend it together in order to get the exact profile he wants in a, mm -hmm. in a very good way, not a derogatory way. Right. So saying, does it have to all be cooked? How much of it has to be cooked? What is the, you know, so if you get rid of the entire cooked part and just go with straight flavor profile, I think that's the only way that, that it would remotely make sense and, and get the whole shit about the pretend history and what it should oh. and should not be. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> There is no should and should not be. I mean, it's the concept of, exactly. of 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 caramelizing your honey, and then at that point, like you say, it becomes a question of what are the parameters here. If blended, how what percentage must be 
caramelized honey if uh you know if it's if it's caramelized what are what are perceived to be off notes and bobby just pointed out um the ash taste you get when it's burnt and he he and i were talking about that this weekend is that there and i've seen this in a lot of bouches is there's like an underlying ashy note to it that really just takes away from it so i would consider that to be a fault in a boche. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. It's a fault in anything. Well, yeah, but you don't t- you don't typically get ashy notes in like traditionals, you know. So so it's not it's not a You just got to put you just got to put more lotion on. <laughs> it puts a lotion <laughs> on its skin or it gets no mead. Um, um, but yeah. So there's but there's like there's some particular faults that I think pertain specifically to this category because it does do oddball things to the honey, you know. And um you know, and so at that point, that's where you have to start kind of listing out what that's going to look like. But I, I think it's a good thing. So let's let's kind of move on a little bit to because we could just debate Bochets all night long, and we have on a couple of other shows. Well, it's not debating Bochets; it's just wrong. Yeah, well, yeah, but uh, there's no history. <laughs> I'll, I'll go with it. There's no history, but uh, and I'm not personally. I don't personally cook my honey, but you know that's a, that's a whole other thing. That's a personal choice. But um, you know, other people, people want to cook their honey behind closed doors. It's none of my business. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, I'll, uh, I'll support them as long as they don't bring it to me. That's right. Don't force me to cook, honey, and and, and it's all good. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Um, but uh, one of the other things that I've seen come up a lot, um, and especially since it, it, and I'm seeing more and more people talking about getting mead certified, uh, you know, judge certified for mead and all of that through the BJCP, including. I was thrilled to see people in Australia and Europe now, and that's really cool. So a um, couple of paths we're going to go down here. One is, um, does the BJCP have plans to expand the mead certification program over time? To, you know, into like you've got all these levels and grandmaster and all that stuff with beer. Is that something that you perceive uh, happening? Do you, do you see that happening with mead? Honestly, no. Okay. Because because the, the in the next three or four or five years, no. Because the interest has been so piss poor, truly. Okay. I mean, the amount of the amount of meat exams we get is, is are very very few a year. Yeah. Um, there there's there's an awful lot of talk about people wanting to be beer judges. There's an awful lot of talk about people wanting to be cider judges. An awful lot of talk about people wanting to be meat judges. But then when it comes down to the fact that they got to sit down and they got to know this stuff and do it, I mean, our, we have a huge dropout rate when, when we give classes even after people paid about showing wow. up and taking the exam, you know? So it, it happens all the time. You'll, you'll find pockets around the country that do an extremely good job of educating uh, mm-hmm. mead wise. And, and people are really interested. And no matter how much of us that, that are really interested in mead and stuff, I mean, you, there are wastelands where you can't find mead one, let alone Chaucer's. I mean, so, so it, it becomes really difficult to start studying or eat, not even just studying to even understand the, the concept of mead and have an interest just because it's not there. Yeah. And because there's such a low low push for it, I mean, in order to try to sort or pick the peanuts out of the food, say, okay, so we're going to try to start doing ranks of, you know, me judge, it gets it gets really, really difficult. I mean, it, it, if there's not enough interest, right, we can do it for sure. Mm-hmm. It's just there needs to be there, – there needs to be an interest in the product rather than just the few of us that are really excited about it, right, because we could do anything. We, we, we can make <laughs> numerous – Ranks, right? You could be like you could be like you know the Navaso Mel judge, and you could be the the Nationalisti Mel judge, or because there has to be a Mel on the end of it, because that's what you people do, right? So it, 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 we could absolutely do that. It just there has to be there has to be a a proven want for it because there's so much shit that all of us have on our plate, you know. And I'm not even talking about the the, the exam committee. This is just straight up. We're just talking just just is there interest in putting on classes and education? Is there interest in the people sitting for the exams? And the, the answer is flatly no. There, there absolutely is not interest. No matter, and, and you know, again, you're talking to a jaded audience, so everybody there is like, he's handsome and stupid. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, you know what? They got one of those two right. Uh, I don't know what I'm talking about. So it's, it, it, we, we really have to get everybody else involved that aren't really in the jaded meat community before we can even start talking about, you know, who, who is the tallest small person in the room. Okay. Yeah, I think the, the last meat. time we offered it was uh, maybe a year and a half ago. And, you know, it starts out, everybody wants it, everybody wants it. We scheduled it. And then I think we ended up at the end, maybe four or five people in the class. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, to Julie's to Julie's point, it's exactly the same thing that happens to us with people who are interested. At, at this this uh, summer's uh, home book on, we will be offering all the meat exams or the, the meat exams again. We'll be offering the beer exams, the, the written exam, the tasting. If people are interested, and they're coming. We're going to be doing it on Wednesday morning. So if people are coming, they're going to get there early. They can take the exam. We'll we'll put as many butts will sit in seats that want to come. I mean, this is this is the perfect time to do it. You, at Mazer, you guys are giving one too, right? Yeah, Thursday afternoon they're giving one at Mazer. Um, the, perfect. Yeah, the AMMA conference is running over top of it, so we gotta we gotta work out some more scheduling as we go forward to make sure that uh, that's separated so that everybody can do both. You know, but yeah, uh, yeah that's yeah. one. I, I I would have had the opportunity to had I gotten had time to get my homework done to take the test when I was up in New York this week uh, over the weekend because. Um, uh, Andrew said that they were having a test, but A, I couldn't stay the extra day, and B, I haven't had time to study. I'm running a conference. I don't have a life right yeah. now. <laughs> oh, bullshit. See, my, my, my advice to anybody that wants to take the meat exam, it's pass-fail. Oh, I know. If you I know, know anything about just, meat at all, just yeah. take the damn thing. Oh, yeah, I know. I just haven't had time to even do that much. I'm literally up to my eyeballs and alligators with the conference. Next year, I'm going to have a lot more free time. But in the meantime, I'm going to. I'm planning on – I don't know. I mean, I never got certified because I've been judging meads since long before there ever was a mead certification test. I was one of the beta question answerers when when they rolled out the beta at the, one of the Mazer Cups. And I'm sitting there with my tongue between my teeth going, okay, if it's a Thursday and there's a blue moon and the grass is growing high, how much acid do I end at the end of the ferment? You know? <laughs> it was like, you know, there were See, some... all the above. See, all of the above. Yeah, exactly. So, but it was, it was just really, you know, it was, so I was part of that, but, um, you know, I've never bothered to get it because I've been judging for so long. I just never felt like I needed to, but I love the study guide and I want to go through that because there's always things to be learned and, um, I want to learn, you know, and I figure, well, if I'm going to go through all the, you know, trouble of, you know, studying and committing to memory, all of the things that maybe I don't already know, I might as well take the test, you know, <laughs> so... But then my my, I, I, my fun I, 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 becomes that nobody ever gives the damn uh, the damn proctor you know the in person test in my part of the country. I have to travel to like another entire section of the country to get one. So. Right, that's exactly what I'm saying. It, 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 the, the issue is is the is, is the want. Yeah. Right, because anybody anybody can put these on, and, and it's it's just not happening now. I mean, okay. w- w- Julie's work Julie's work on the program. Hopefully, we'll get get more stuff out. Me coming to Maester Cup and be able to have FaceTime with all these people. Uh, they can yell at me or give me free booze or give me a hug, whatever. I'm <laughs> There's a good hugger. parties, you know, so you're just... going to be out there. We'll drag you off to parties, get you drunk, and pick your brains. Yeah, you know, see, people always say that, you know, always talk about taking me out and getting me drunk, and it always ends poorly for them. I mean, <laughs> it, it, oh, you haven't every, met every Hamish. Time, you haven't met we'll Hamish and Sergio Hamish. yet. We'll set you. We'll set you down with Hamish and Sergio. Trust me. <laughs> Perfect. No, this is this is this is not this is not braggadocious. I'd like to have two drinks without someone getting shitty. I was like, please, is there people that can actually, are grown-ass adults that can handle two drinks without being fucking idiots? I mean, fun. Not, not, I'm not talking about fun idiots. I'm just talking like, bleh. Like, uh, no, this crowd's hard. This this crowd can handle it. <laughs> yeah, people say that all the time. And then, they, especially when it comes to, especially when it comes to mead, because, you know, people know how to drink beer, and they know how to drink booze, and they know how to drink wine, and then all of a sudden they start drinking mead like it's beer. And then they're all shitty, puking in Steve Flay's foot. Oh yeah, but see, we we drink we we drink so much mead, you know. I mean, there's people who spend months conditioning their liver before the maser. It's pretty funny. Hey man, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So yeah, it'll be fun. You'll you'll enjoy it. It'll be really cool. Um. So, what was the next? I was gonna ask. Oh, um. I was getting. Is it is it basically the same sort of thing for like the European folks are wanting to start certifying? They've got they've formed a European Mead Makers uh, Association, and and so they're really getting active and organizing, and they want to. Um, dang it, Jaden, stop that! <laughs> Jaden keeps typing shit. It's like, oh my god, I'm gonna have to smack him. <laughs> um, anyway, so they're talking about wanting to take. Um, you know, the meat exams, but they're, I mean, they're flat isn't anybody. So can anybody in Europe do the same thing that anybody in the States can do? Yeah. They can, as long they as can as hold a proper exam. We're, 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 yeah, we're global, man. The okay. only thing, the only thing we want to make sure is to do is have a proctor there, right? The BGCP will usually sponsor uh, a, a ranking judge, a high ranking judge to go do that. Uh-huh. I mean, we, my family, my wife's Hungarian. So we go to, we go to Hungary about once a year. 
Okay. Well, I'm in I'm in Central Europe. Okay. At least once a year. I'm in South America a few times a year. So, you know, anybody that ever wants to can can email me directly. I want to know, especially you know, how to get started. We can we can get you all hooked up with everything you need. How, how to run your classes. What you're gonna what's gonna be required of you. When we can set the date. Um, how long out it's going to be, how hard it will be for them, what's, you know, it's, it's we, that, that's the whole, you know, me being the education liaison, no, that's the entire point of, of having done this for so long. I mean, Bruce, Bruce being the director and Julie being the assistant director of, of the education and, and me being the liaison, trying to, trying to assist them taking some of that basically, uh, hand holding the wrong word, but basically helping these people through all the stuff that they're doing and all the stuff that we have done before. So yeah, they just email me at Kristen at bgcp dot org, and we can we, we we can help them out for sure. Um, okay. There's a, there's a lot of people. In, there's a few people in China now that, that that I mean they've taken a few beer exams. They're interested in me too. Um, the, the only thing, the only different thing that that we'll start to see as we start getting more global for the me is is just different monofloral stuff in the different wild. You know, so you know in in South America, I've had some really cool stuff, some really cool passion fruit blossom, and some crazy Brazilian stuff. They can't even describe the fruit. It's like a round thing that grows on a tree with a hair that looks like it's crawling away. You know, they always have these crazy descriptions. <laughs> I'm not joking. These crazy descriptions. This honey comes from this thing in the middle of uh, you know the Amazon. I'm like, well, that's unfair, <laughs> right? So, yeah. And then you know. There's there in the education is is heavily lacking honey honey wise specifically honey not just me but honey wise in in a lot of in a lot of uh, Europe and a lot of South America too where where you know we have the National Honey Board here that does a good job of you know kind of describing a, a solid amount of solid amount of honey Chile Argentina Uruguay they they're pretty big in honey honey production same as Brazil but when it comes to monofloral stuff um, they're not it's, it's not really a thing. They're, most of their monofloral stuff, right? It's not like we're growing, we're, we're making honey monofloral for a reason. Like uh, the bees go here, right? The bees go here. So um, you're seeing you're seeing an awful lot of stuff out of Europe. You're seeing a lot of forest honey, and the problem with a lot of forest honey is what they actually mean is it's Turkish honey, which is bug shit. You know, it's <laughs> technically not technically not honey that people are saying that it's extremely wonderful and and you should get it and it's more expensive and then when you tell them exactly it's secreted by bugs and then they say well doesn't doesn't honey come from bee mouths and you're like okay never mind never mind we're done here but <laughs> never mind never mind never mind yeah, yeah but yeah we're, we're definitely an international organization and um you don't know what you don't know and the whole point of me being on here and me being going to the major stuff is to bring bring more awareness to it right because you know in st paul here an awful lot of us make 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 mead and and we've been up against each other for a long time, competing each other, and we've made each other better, and we know what good meat is, and, and we want to we want to share share that knowledge around. And, and it, it, the easiest way to do it is just, you know, just have have a face face to face conversation. But you can't be everywhere, so you know, something like 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 your amazing amazing podcast so far. I mean, we try. I think that's. We try. You're not trying very hard, so you should probably, you know. Yeah, I should probably. Me, me, we're very bit. trying. Ask my I, mother. Yeah, yeah. This no, is trying. Are, Holy shit! Trying, never mind. Yeah. Then good job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we try to be as annoying as possible. It seems to be working. So, um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, well, I mean, it sounds like you guys have, you know, I mean, I I understand better now, you know, what it is that you know, the BJCP, where it's coming from and what's involved, because I didn't know some of these things, you know, that's why I'm asking the questions. But, um, <clears throat> excuse me. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's good to know what sort of things needs to happen for that kind of stuff to happen, you know, to get new categories, to have uh, more tests and things like that. And uh, I'm going to let the European guys know. I'm going to say, look, okay, here's Kristen's email. You know, email yep, Chris, talk Absolutely. to him about it, and start putting some because they were they were going. We really want to certify, and I'm going great. Then let's you know contact the BJCP. But if I give your particular email, they'll probably be a whole lot less intimidated because they're all like, we don't even know what to do. You know, so yeah, it's in you know, dear dear to whom it may might it may be concerned. Yeah. Dear I'm, person I am, at the BJCP. <laughs> yes, yeah, right, because because in other cultures, the first thing you do is be very general. The second thing you do is apologize. Yep. Like. I apologize if this sets you back because you don't know who I am. I apologize <laughs> for taking up some of your time. However, I would really like this information, right? And giving them, giving them a, a person to talk to uh, will go a long way. And then once it goes from there, then spreading the word becomes much, much easier, saying, hey, you know, there's another group over here. There's another group over here. They re they're really interested in pushing it around. So hopefully we'll all be able 
I don't want to say learn together because there's an awful lot of lazy people, but I will say we'll ha- we will give them the ammunition they need to be able to, 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 to do what, what their goal is. And if their goal is to be lazy, they can disregard all of it. Okay. Oh, we've got uh, input from the um, from actually from the Spreaker chat, which is the for straight from the radio show software. Um, Shane Coombs is saying. Um, he says Julie, nobody believes anything Shane says. Nobody said believes anything Shane <laughs> says. Yeah, he says nope. uh, I don't I don't know if he's screwing with me or if this is the, if this is real. So Shane, if you're using me to mess with Julie, I will find you. I will kill you. Um, <laughs> but he says would like you to help. Uh, change some of the BJCP descriptions as he disagrees with some. Shane disagrees with everything. Tell uh, Shane to email me. Shane, uh, Shane, email me. God damn it, you have my email. Yeah. I know okay. you're 65 years old and you forget where the fuck you are half the time, but email me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor Shane. Oh, sh- <laughs> That's what he gets from Shane, Piper, right? Shane, Shane, says, Shane says, shut up, Kristen. <laughs> did he spell my name right? Yes, he did. Oh, uh, he it was it was a copy and paste. He was ready to say that before anything. Probably, it was pretty up. fast after you said that, so it could be. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Shane, um, email me. You hear that, Shane? Email him. That way, I could disregard you directly. He said. He says, "Ha ha." <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll use that chat going forward since the Russian bots seem to like our regular one so so well. Um, so, Julie, anything to anything more to add on the BJCP stuff? No, it's just all that material's out there on the site. You know, the site's easy enough to find. I know we're changing over to a new one, but you can get out there. And it really is, you know, my job was easy. Everything existed. The resources were out there. Um, the guidelines were out there. So I just kind of put it together so people can do a self-study if they want. If they don't have other resources, they can go out there. It's more fun in a class setting or with other friends because then you can share a lot of needs and honeys and discuss it. But the materials out there, as like Kristen said, if you've got the goal, if you want to do it, you can get the material, you can study it, you can take the online exam. Uh, once you do that, you know, then you have to find a tasting exam. But, you know, I, I don't want to say it's easy, but it can be easy if this is really what you want to do. Well, Everything and- is out there for you. You guys were saying that, uh, well, Kristen was saying that that you'll sponsor a judge to go into an area that doesn't necessarily have one. Because I'm thinking, at least for my area, that's never happened before. But we're starting to see more and more meet people come out of the woodwork in North Carolina. So I would not be averse to, you know, helping to coordinate and set up um, both a training, tasting, and knowledge sharing class as well as then organizing and finding a place to, and I've got a couple places in mind where the test could be administered so that, you know, they can do the, the you know, the physical exam. Oh, that didn't come out right. <laughs> the, the, in-person, <laughs> the in-person exam, back up, reverse that, delete. Um, so would that be a, would that be a, spec, a speculum mel then? I don't know. You tell me. You're the BJCP. <laughs> But um, yeah, to well, I know a lot of us have traveled to proctor exams as well. You know, um, you know, and it's fun. Is you know, like I said, I make that part of my vacation, so just kind of work it in. But you know, a lot of us uh, do travel different places to proctor and just to help okay. out, and because it's it's fun. Okay. Well, then, uh, that I think one of the things that we probably need to promote, and and that's something that I'll have to bring up with the AMMA is to promote the knowledge of me by promoting, helping to promote, you know, meat certification because you have to, you have to learn about meat or you're not going to pass the test, even the pass fail. Right. So, you know, right. you know, that, that will help to promote that mead uh, knowledge as well as create more mead judges, which will generate more mead entries and more mead competitions and everybody benefits. So, um, yeah, you know, right. yeah. I it, mean, it, the biggest, the biggest, issue, the biggest issue I see with, with a lot of the, um, untrained or untrained is the wrong word. A lot of the uncertified people are there. Um, sometimes it gets to a point where you're you're uh, you're looked upon as as knowing so much that you don't want to come and get certified pass fail, right? So you have a lot of these hmm. meat makers, regardless of how long they've been doing things. Um, it might be bad for business if if they don't if they don't pass. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it it. it it's a completely different world when it comes to things like that, um, and 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 a lot a lot of meat makers, same as well, probably even more so, a lot of brewers, they want to be a judge just because this is what they do. Uh-huh. 
Um, I get I, I get that, but I still highly highly encourage people to be to be judges too, right? Because I mean, there's there's a lot of great coaches out there that were absolutely shit at, at, at their sport. There's a lot of fantastic coaches, and a lot of people fantastic at your sports are really bad at coaching. But mm-hmm. so just because you make beer, just because you make meat, doesn't mean you're good. At, you doesn't mean you're, you're good. You're going to be a good judge. Doesn't I mean it doesn't mean you won't, but it also doesn't mean you will be. So what it what it also allows to do is the people running these competitions, right? Where you enter things for a lot of money commercially, you want as as an organizer, you want to ensure that you have the best talent that you have at the table, not just you know Doug because he has you know something something Renfest meter or whatever the hell it's called. Right, it's <laughs> it's, it's really it's it's really important for for both for both ends that when you enter a competition like as a, as as a meat baker you want to make sure that there's people that know what the shit you're talking about, and at the same time as as an organizer you really want the people that are entering to really want to enter and know they're going to get great feedback and there's people there rather than just a room full of guys uh, that like playing video games um, talking about Star Star Wars or Star Trek sorry not Star Wars that's great Star Trek and then you know. Uh, <laughs> And, and slopping meat all over each other, right? It, it, it's, hey, it's we don't slop important. meat. I don't know about you, dude, but that's we don't alcohol slop abuse. meat. Yeah, that's alcohol abuse. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I told you we'll see it, Mazer. Shane, Shane, has, <laughs> Shane has another comment. He says Chris will uh, – uh, he's, he's mostly interested in uh, honey varietal descriptors. So email him. You know, Shane, he told you to email him, so he's, that's what he's going to say, so Shane, I'll just say it for him. <laughs> if Shane's into his bullshit buckwheat thing again, where oh, he God. and I can have a conversation <laughs> about burnt, tur- burnt, tur- burnt hair and silage. Yeah, uh, so, I yeah. always, oh. my, my favorite descriptor for eastern buckwheat, and western doesn't, not so much with this, my favorite descriptor for eastern buckwheat has always been the inside of the locker room after the big game. Yeah, uh, it's. There's unique, unique stuff. I yeah. had, a, I, I can tell you, I had a fantastic buckwheat not so long ago. I got a buddy. He's seven percent Irish. He, uh, he was exceedingly excited about this buckwheat, and I told him I hate buckwheat, and he poured it for me. I was like, "That's really good. That's not buckwheat." Said, yes, it is. I'm like, "I'm sorry, Irishman. This is, this doesn't taste anything like buckwheat." So uh, that that's a completely different tangent on what what the honey is, what you're making versus what is actually written on the container of honey that you buy. Yeah. Right? Eastern, Western, Northern Canadian, Eastern Canadian, Nunavutian, Nunavutian, Southeast Florida. Yeah. <laughs> nope, 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 pass. <laughs> well, and, and the buckwheat, what they call buckwheat in Poland, doesn't taste anything like the buckwheat varietals I've tried here. So I don't know if it's right. just that there's a lot of things called buckwheat or what. Um, I think it also has a lot to do, too, with the soil said buckwheat is grown in. You know, I mean, that's going to get characteristics. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's going to get characteristics from that, so. Jaden is claiming the buckwheat out there, Western Canada, isn't like that. <laughs> I told you, it's from Nunavut. Everything's, everything's gilded in the <laughs> land of gold. <laughs> yeah, you know, Jaden, it's a shame you're not coming to the to the AMMA conference in the Mazer Cup because I'll just sit Kristen on you. <laughs> See who can out sarcasm who. Jaden fancies himself really good at sarcasm. I've had to slap him down once or twice because he lets it a little too far loose occasionally. But uh, <laughs> um, but yeah. Well, he, well, he is he is Canadian, and I and I will and I will absolutely say that most Canadians, like the British, are more sarcastic than American, or at least at least understand sarcasm more than the vast majority of, of Americans. Uh, but being from Nunavut, I don't know if you'd understand what I'm saying right now. Well, he, says he's he's not, he says he's not from Nunavut, but, you know. Did he spell Nunavut right? N-U-N-A-V-U-T. <laughs> I don't know if that's right. Yeah, or not. yeah, he did. Okay. Did he capitalize it? No, he did not. No. We're all lazy. He's None definitely from Nunavut. Anything. He's, he's... <laughs> He says, well met, sir, dot, 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 dot. <laughs> Too bad you're not coming, Jaden. This could be fun. You know, he's going to be there. You can hand you both a glass and then stand off and watch the fireworks. It'd be fun. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> AJ and I get a front row seat. We'd just be sitting there laughing. <laughs> and honestly, I, I my local buckwheat honey is, you know, I'm, I'm Eastern. I don't find it tastes like barnyard. It's not the most pleasant thing in the world, but I don't find it tastes like the terrible descriptions everybody else gives. The it could be regional too. I mean, the stuff I've had is from the cent- uh, central eastern U.S., which 
is probably going to be completely different than the dirt you guys have in Ottawa. You know, I mean, it's going to be different, and maybe even a different variety of buckwheat itself. I I gather, yeah, and I know farmer too. that there's like multiple things called buckwheat in terms of the plants. So. Yeah, and probably different ones grow in different uh, different zones and all right. of that. Yeah, so. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you right now. I guarantee the best buckwheat honey you can buy in Canada is in Quebec, and every single Quebecois will tell you that. Of course they will. No matter what. Well, I'm right up against the border, so <laughs> this stuff from Ontario is probably not bad. <laughs> no, no, the Quebecois would say wrong. There's this better. They're I mean, you would be wrong. able to understand what they're saying, but. <laughs> oh, I would. I speak. She would. She 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 speaks Quebecois. <laughs> oh, it's Quebecois. Okay. Thank you for not saying French. <laughs> It, it's no, like no, a duck. Epic wah, is wah. not Parisian French. Yeah, <laughs> correct. <laughs> Very definitely not. <laughs> and half it's half English at this point, anyways. But just don't let them hear me say that. Uh, yeah, we'll try not to yeah, tell. Yeah, it's, it's not on the internet. Yeah, <laughs> it's not. Yeah, this is in our private chat room, and it's, you know the Russian bots are the only ones that see it besides us. So, right. Um, yeah, but. Uh, <laughs> All right, well, my grandmother's I, a Quebecer. I can say these things. There you go, um, Chris. I know you're coming out. Are you coming out for both the conference and the MCI, or are you just the MCI? Absolutely not. I would. I would love to come to the conference and sit in front row and ask questions. But that would I, be will be there, I will be there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I will be there. Oh, I will be there Friday. I'll be well, actually Friday evening. I'll be there. So I'll be there oh, Friday okay. evening and all day all day Saturday. And Saturday. Just in time for the really wild parties. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. All right. If you mean about... people puking in ficuses. <laughs> um, <laughs> probably. And trying to find rooms that don't exist. You know, stairway yeah, nine and three quarters. You know, we had Hamish looking for a room that didn't exist last year with pictures. Someone gave him the wrong number. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was Sergio. I think it was just Sergio screwing with him, but that's just my <laughs> take kind of thing. You know, it wouldn't surprise me. Since they had the "Who Can Drink Each Other Under the Table" first contest going last year, um, <laughs> but hey, uh, the See, they both either? won. Yeah, well, they, they both were, won. They were both still standing, so there was that. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure what I make I of that. But both lost. yeah, Julie, what about you? You coming out? Yep, I'm going to be out there Wednesday and then through Monday. Cool, coming to the conference. Jesus Christ, I go to work. Yeah, my. I, she, she said she My takes her vacation there, so. to do this stuff, so yeah. I'm picking on her, Chris. Jeez. <laughs> Just because you can't come out all week doesn't mean you get to bag on Julie. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> Incorrect. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Well, hum me down, Julie. We'll, we'll party. I'll, I'll be right. kind of hard to miss. I'll be the hairy-looking short woman, short middle-aged woman who wants to kill people during the conference. Uh, and, and I'll be the weirdo following on yeah, her heels. AJ will be the person next to me going, please don't kill that person. We'll get arrested. <laughs> and then we'll I'll miss be wearing the rest my bad example event. ball cap. Yeah. I still need to get you that shirt that says, in my defense, I was left unsupervised. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, cool. I'm looking forward to meeting both y'all. That'll be That'll be great. Vicky, haven't you and I judged together like seven times? Probably, yeah. I think we probably oh, have. Oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, uh, yeah. This yeah. could be interesting. <laughs> uh, you know what? I, I have this plethora of friends that have zero capacity for, for – they have alcohol-induced uh, uh, like hypnesia. They I don't just think... have zero ability to – Well, no, I'm a, t- I'm a terrible with names, and B – I don't know that I ever connected this you with that you. <laughs> so, oh, so you confused my dancing, my dancing me with my beer or my beer and me face? Something, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's, it's, it's funny because uh, there are people that I meet outside of like, you know, the main event, if you will, you know, the, the, the AMMA conference, Mazer cup, um, that that I you know I have to go. Oh yeah, right. I remember you. You're across the table from me. You thought this was good, and you were so wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I just I am I am I am like super shitty with names. I have always been that way, which is hilarious because I'm in marketing, you know. But um, there you go. It's just what it is. It's just... Well, you know, in your defense, there's an awful lot of men named Kristen. And, not Kristen, but there's several Chris's, <laughs> you know, so, so if you introduced yourself as Chris as opposed to Kristen, then yeah, then I would have a really good excuse, but uh, if you introduce yourself as Kristen, then no, then I have no excuse, except that I'm really shitty with names. <laughs> you could just say, I don't care. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. I only didn't. I only didn't remember you because you put you were, zero. Uh, you were just boring. You were so basically. unmemorable, Chris. I'm uh, just, you know, saying. So totally. I get that a lot. Yeah. So. No, I would. Unmemorable. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. So, yeah, all right. Well, hopefully we'll be across the table from each other again this year. That'd be cool. Super. But, and you guys are welcome to stick around because we're going to talk about Oak with, uh, with with Adam. Yeah, he's going to he's giving a talk about uh, Oaking Meads at the conference. So, Adam, you still there? Is that poor Chris, bastard like, had to the line? I'm here. Oh, fuck. I'm here. Poor bastard. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys are doing a very well job of, uh, of of controlling the conversation, so I was just kind of enjoying it myself in the background. <laughs> just cruising, yeah. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, it was. So, um, Adam, tell us a little bit about Haymaker and what you guys have been doing. Sure. Haymaker, we're a uh, meadery in Pennsylvania. Um, we... Uh, we're still pretty small, um, but we're uh, we're in the process of growth. Um, I think like most of the meat market right now, um, we're doing a lot of. Uh, we focus mainly on, on dry and semi sweet meads, um, but I would say I'm starting to uh, venture into uh, sweet meads myself. Uh, I'm finding that sweet meads need to be balanced, and there's a lot of unbalanced sweet meads. Um, that have been on the market, but uh, it seems that there's more and more properly balanced sweet meads out there now, which is refreshing to see. Um, you know, uh, as we all know, the sweet meads can be cloying and they can be unbalanced, and, and but with proper proper techniques and paying attention, like we talked about with acid or with fruit or with oak, anything of that nature, that it can be balanced and it can be something of uh, something beautiful. Uh, so we're we're starting to play with those ourselves, but primarily we, we focus on dry and semi-sweet meads, uh, and we do a, a bunch of barrel aged meads as well, which has always been my passion. Um, I, I love barrel aging. Uh, I've been involved in the barrel aging business for for a while now, and uh, to be able to uh, incorporate that into Haymaker uh, is a lot of fun for me, for sure. Cool. How long is uh, how long has uh, Haymaker been open? We opened in. 2015. Uh, wow. Yeah. Time flies. Spring of 2015. Yeah, you're not kidding. Yeah, I remember uh, when yeah, you guys so... opened, and it's like they all start to run together after a while, and I can't remember who opened when, but yeah, wow, time yeah. flies. I'm getting old. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, you're, you're telling me. Uh, so it was it was a weekend warrior uh, thing for me in evenings for the first uh, two and a half years, and then starting this January. So just a, just a just shy of two months ago, I'm, I'm now full time with Haymaker uh, with Haymaker myself, Congratulations. and uh, which is awesome. Thank you. You quit the real it, job, uh, it, huh? It, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I quit the real job. Uh, it's uh, it's it, it, it's giving me much more freedom and much more ability to pay attention to the the trends that's happening in in mead, uh, focusing on our meads ourselves, being able to put out more uh, small batch meads, test meads, uh, be able to do stuff with our tasting room. Um, you know, and, and be able to put things out there that I just didn't have time to do or focus on before. So it's, uh, it, it, it's a lot of fun. That's for sure. That's very cool. And how long, how long have you personally been making mead? I mean, you know, a, a my, home and pro. My first mead I made in 2004. Nice. Um, and believe it or not, I have, uh, I still have like two bottles of it and one of them my mom has. So my mom's always no best, I guess. And she's held on to it and she says she's never going to drink it, but at some point uh, I'll, I'll make her, I'll make her drink it or we'll all enjoy it together. <laughs> but, uh, it, it sits up in her, in her, uh, in her wine, uh, her wine rack that holds, you know, six bottles of wine. Cause she's, she's not a very big drinker herself, but she likes a glass of wine every now and then. But, uh. It's fun to see it, and uh, I know one day we will definitely open it up. And I, I don't know when that'll be, but I mean we're pushing 16 through now, we're pushing 13 years old now. So, uh, well, yeah, 13 years. So it's it's old, and, it, and I had one probably two years ago, and it still tasted pretty good. You know, for for me made in 2004 when I had no idea what I was doing, and and probably. <laughs> Through a bunch of honey, water, yeast, and, and maybe yeast nutrient, uh, and as generic of a yeast nutrient as you could get, 
uh, into it all at once and just let it ferment. Uh, I definitely remember about a month and a half, two month fermentation on that, and uh, it still tastes. Uh, it's not bad. It, it, it's far from the winter, but uh, it's it's always fun to open up a bottle of it and and try it and see how far we come. Cool. That is really cool. So, um, what are some of the, and don't give away all your secrets because, you know, you're going to be giving a talk in a couple of weeks. Um, not even two weeks now. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so what got you, when did you start trying oak and, and, you know, did you try it just because, A, you know, because, hey, it's oak and I want to mess with this or, or did you have a specific thing that you were kind of going for? Uh I've, always, I've, I've been involved in the beer industry for a while, so uh, before I started the meadery and, and before uh, my, my previous or my, my, yeah, my previous job, I've, I've been in the beer industry working for breweries, working for you know, uh, different aspects of the beer industry, if, whether it's a distributor, whether it's selling barrels to breweries, whether it's working for the brewery. Uh, and, and because of that, I always had an interest in oak, uh, oak beers, bourbon beers, wine beers, sour beers. Um, and because of that, I, as I started making meat at home uh, and, and expanding what I was doing, and, you know, you, you can only make so many traditional meats or only so many metal mouths before your, your interest peak and you're ready to try something new, um, uh, barrel aging came, came naturally to me. Um, so I started doing some barrel aging meat uh, as a home meat maker um, and absolutely loved what, what was happening. Um, I was lucky enough to have access to a lot of professional brewers that I could ask a million and one questions and, and, and bug them endlessly about how do I do this? What, what's the best way to go about this? Is this right? Does this taste good? Is, is this taste terrible? Um, and, and because of that, uh, when I started barrel aging meads at, at a home level, um, I, I really enjoyed what I did. I started entering them into competitions as a home mead maker and, and won a decent amount of, uh, of awards for some of my, my uh, barrel-aged meads. Um, from there, you know, the interest peaked into starting my own meadery, uh, and then uh, uh, which, which quickly developed into, you know, making barrel-aged meads. Um, you know, in 2015 we were doing it, um, or when we first started doing it. Um, definitely was happening for, for a while, but there there wasn't that many out there. Uh, you know, I think, like you guys spoke about earlier in the conversation about uh, uh, bouchets and, and, and uh, pepper meads, that they're, they're all extremely popular right now. I, I think as well barrel-aged meads are, are gaining as much popularity, um, and, and I love seeing that. Um, yeah, I agree. I love that they've added it, oak it, to the description so that now you can pretty much oak any mead and it doesn't kick you out of the category. Exactly. Yeah, and, and and we do a lot of stuff like that at Haymaker, where we have you know we have a mead called Parlor that is a our, our play on a, a bourbon old fashioned. Um, you know, I'm I'm I love whiskeys and I love scotches. Uh, so for me to be able to make a uh, you know our our version of a bourbon old fashioned mead um, is is awesome. And there's tons and tons of of bourbon in that mead. Uh, we also do a raspberry uh, mead with buckwheat honey that's aged in red wine barrels, and it's a clean, uh, clean barrel aging. And but it's it, you wouldn't know that that barrel uh, that that mead was barrel aged on, until you read it in the label. So I tell you, uh, because it's not it's it's not heavy heavy at all. But you get these micro oxidations, you get this tannin that comes from it. It adds structure and it adds a body to it. Um, where that mead, I've, I've entered it into just as a classic mellow mel and, and done very well. Um, I've also entered it into barrel aging and not done so well because, again, I think they're looking for, a, a, you know, a, they're looking for the barrel presence to be uh, bold. Um, but barrel aging doesn't have to mean that you're putting it in, in bourbon or oak or, um, I'm sorry, bourbon or rum or tequila or something that is loud and, and screams what it is. It can be... Uh, you know, it can be as, as minor as exactly that, a used red wine barrel that's virtually neutral, but you're going to get the micro-oxidation, you're going to pull some tannins out of the French oak barrel that we use. Um, so, you know, it, it, can, it can be a, a, a ton of different things. Uh, and, it, and I think we're just starting to scratch the surface on it, and I'm, I'm loving to see what's happening in the meat world right now with, you know, the ones I get my hands on, um, whether they are big and bold or whether they're, they're subtle. Yeah, it's interesting to see, too, what's being used. I mean, um, 
I saw through the trip I took this summer and then just even on this New York trip, rye barrels, bourbon barrels, whiskey barrels, um, Chardonnay barrels. Uh, oh, there was a, somebody who was using a tequila barrel um, on yep. on one of my stops. And what else have I seen? Red wine barrels, white wine barrels, uh, port barrels, sherry barrels. Gin. Gin barrels, gin, yeah. Gin's becoming better. Yep, gin, uh, barrel-aged gins are, are becoming huge and extremely popular. Uh, the problem with barrel-aged gin barrels, uh, with barrel, uh, with gin barrels, is that there's not many on the market, so the supply and demand is is in their favor. They can charge almost whatever they want. Um, yeah. But even more outside of spirits and, and of wine are new barrels, and I think there's endless opportunities for new barrels, and it's not even, you know, around white oak or, or French oak or Hungarian oak or European oak anymore. Now you have access to acacia and cherry and yellow mm-hmm. birch. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, you, you name it, and, you know, hard maple and all of these interesting barrels that are being made now. And they're being made for the, for the wine industry, uh, and they're being made for the distilling industry. Um, and either one of those can work well for for meteries and for home winemakers. I mean, there are there are chips uh, and and cubes uh, or oak rice or oak chips and all this that are available from you know specific um, uh, uh, cooperages that are offering acacia and cherry and uh, and and yeah, I mean, some really awesome you know wood that hasn't necessarily been used before or is a new uh, a, a new alternative to, to aging stuff. And, and to be honest with you, I personally don't even know that much about them yet. I'm doing lots of experiments with them at, at Haymaker and doing lots of experiments at home uh, just to learn about these different oaks and these different woods. Um, wow. But they're, they're so Black, new Black that it's fun. What's that? Black Swan up here in Minnesota does a uh, crap load of it. Yep, I just got a huge package from Black Swan um, and was talking with them about, but I got, I think, eight different types of, of wood, yep, yep. I, I'll call it, from Black, from Black Swan, and I actually have um, at home, and, I, and obviously I, I do lots of test batches at home still, but I, I just did a big 10-gallon batch of, of a traditional mead, you know, pretty standard, semi-sweet, um, on the low end of semi-sweet, and I'm aging them, uh, one-gallon batches, I'm aging all these different woods and oaks in to see what comes of it. Um, and uh, I'm really, really intrigued by what's going to come of that. They're doing the, the, the comb uh, oak, if you will, where they're, they're making it look like honeycomb. The oak, they're, they're drilling through it, so there's more surface area. I like um, the so honeycomb-looking ones. That, that, yeah, and the idea yeah. behind that is you can put a stave in or one small stave or, or, you know, uh, uh, and the, the surface area is much larger. Uh, therefore, you'll get more, more contact uh, with your mead, and it should impart its flavors faster. Yeah. Something else that I'm seeing um, starting to happen in the industry in the, at the pro level, and I imagine it'll start to trickle down to the home mead maker level as well, is, um, uh, you know, the, the pro makers are getting their barrels from wineries, distilleries of various types and so forth. And then what's also starting to happen is now the distilleries are starting to seek out mead barrels, you know, so barrels that yeah. maybe you got from something else. So like you age, you just aged your triple berry melamel in, you know, in this uh, bourbon barrel. And then this gin guy comes along and says, I would love to age my gin in that. Can you imagine pink gin? That'd be so awesome. Um, <laughs> yep. yep. Yeah. It's, it's definitely happening. And, and we, we definitely sell, Haymaker definitely sells our, our, are used mead barrels to local breweries in the Pennsylvania area, and, and they're yeah. putting out some incredible stuff with it. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's and at the same light, um, yeah. in, in, the same, in the same light, I'm starting to see a lot of meaderies. Uh, also, Haymaker is definitely doing it, but there's others that are doing it out there that I, I love to see. And it's, it's interesting how the same idea can happen between, you know, 10, 20 meteries throughout the U.S. right around the same time, but there's a lot of meteries right now that are seeking out beer barrels. So, yep. you know, take, a, take an infamous beer barrel out there that's a big Russian imperial stout aged in, you know, uh, in, in a bourbon barrel or a rum barrel uh, for a year, and there's not going to be much bourbon left in there because it would have been taken up by that beer. But now you have this, this huge Russian imperial stout um, that now has left its, its flavor, its, its profile on that barrel, and mead makers are grabbing those and aging their mead in them. Um, you know, 
there's an array of different types of mead that are going in there. But that, that's fantastic. I, I love seeing that, that the, you know, the, the mead world is getting involved with the, with the breweries, is getting involved with the distilleries, or that distilleries are seeking us out to get our barrels and age their whiskeys. I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm a believer in, you know, all, any press and all press is good press. So if, if, a, if a distillery starts aging their, their you know, uh, their bourbon, or I guess at that point it would be whiskey because it's not going into a, uh, into a, a virgin barrel, but uh, at that point it would be whiskey. But if they're aging their whiskey in a mead barrel, they're at least bringing that word mead to the forefront, and people are going to ask questions. Well, what is mead? What was this agent before? And they're going to Google it, and hopefully they're going to find one of us, and, and they're going to want to come out and try it, and it's, it's press, and it's, it's good press. Yeah. Yeah, it is. If, and... I were you, if I were you, I would start – if I were you, I'd start suggesting that these – because we have a distillery too, and I would start suggesting that these people use, use your barrels for finishing barrels. Rather than rather than the extended age, so just your regular stuff for extended aging and use these fantastic you know kind of um, Corvettes that you guys have uh, to use for finishing for finishing their gins and for finishing their their booze. Kind of like you do for Scotch, right? Three months in a port. Yeah, yeah, three it's, 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 yeah. There's a lot of bourbons out there, like you said, exactly like Scotch does with sherry or something of that nature. Well, they'll they'll age in you know an ex bourbon barrels and then they'll finish it in a sherry cask. Um, exactly. Absolutely, uh, and I would completely, completely agree with that. Um, you know, I, I don't know if they've come, if they've thought that far into it yet. I think they're just kind of putting something in there and seeing how it works. Um, you know, I, I think honey and, and meat in general have a lot to give, and there's a lot left in that barrel. Um, you know, the, the biggest issue comes with these barrels, and this is what I dealt with in my, in my previous job, is that, you know, you have a bourbon barrel, it's held bourbon for, you know, three, four years, hopefully, maybe two or maybe more. Um, but that barrel is meant to be used once, or it's, it's built to be used once. It's a turn and burn barrel, if you will. Um, you know, they, they still build these barrels not to be used outside of, of, of the distilling industry. Now you have a, 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 a brewery who's buying it, and then they buy it, and then they age their beer in it for six months to a year. Uh, or a meadery buys it and they age it in for six months to a year, and then now a distillery wants it back, and then they buy it, and so now you have this 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 barrel that's you know uh, built to to hold liquid once. Uh, the staves are thick, they're they're thinner, they're 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 going to weep, um, and now you have a third person coming into it, and and there's a lot of problems with those barrels. Um, as long as they understand that what they're getting themselves into. Um, that's good. I, as, as a mead maker and as someone who owns a meadery, I don't want them to take this barrel and put their, their liquor back into it and it leaks and, they, and we get blamed for it. Um, you know, it, it's a barrel that's not meant to, for prolonged use, uh, whereas the wine barrels are. So it's, it's an interesting, uh, interesting market for sure. Um, it is. It just needs some education. It does, yeah, and that's something that we're working to, you know, you're going to be doing some of, and and uh, I know um, Ryan's been doing some stuff with that. We have a question on the chat. David Webb is asking, um, he wonders if anyone is making barrels with more than one wood variety, so do you know, like an acacia mesquite barrel or something like that? Absolutely. Um, I, that doesn't happen in barrels that often, and when I, when I use the term barrel, and this will be something that I'll go through in my speech, is there's different terminology for wood vessels. Um, you have barrels. Uh, barrels are generally up to 60 gallons. So think of a wine barrel at 60 gallons, generally a liquor barrel, rum, tequila, bourbon is 53 gallons. When you go above that and beyond that, you walk into the world of punch-ins, uh, you walk into hogsheads or cognac barrels or sherry butts. Those are all 300 liters, 500 liters, 400 liters. And then above that, you go into casks and fooders. When you get into the larger stuff, absolutely, there is, there is a, a technique known as zebra. Um, and that could be a mix of ash and Hungarian oak. Or it could be a mix of uh, uh, French oak and uh, maybe acacia. Um, and the idea behind that is if you're looking uh, if a winery or, or a brewery uh, or, or even a meadery is looking for to buy a larger barrel, of, let's say a 500-liter punch-in, um, but they don't want all of that intense. They want to buy a new barrel, but they don't want all that intense oak uh, that's going to come with a new one right away. They could buy a zebra punch-in that would be 50% um, 
French oak and 50% acacia. And the acacia is not anywhere near, uh, it's going to give as much oak and tannin and all of that that they want. So you're only going to be getting 50% of that oak presence in your beer, wine, mead uh, at that point. And the acacia on the other side will, will calm that, that down, but you'll be able to put it in there as a new one and, and store it for six months rather than three months and have to move it. So, yeah, that definitely happens a lot. That's cool. I yeah I yeah you know, I never really I always thought of it just you know as oak but I mean I can see too a lot and we're gonna go way beyond just uh, you know you get the the oak notes and the tannins but also just like what sort of flavor notes can you pull out of various types of wood you know I mean we've yep, been doing exactly. it with smoking for decades you know or maybe even centuries I don't know but you know I mean smoking with particular types of wood I had a buddy. Um, who uh, would he, – he was just huge on cherry wood and apple wood, you know, were, were his big smoking favorites. And I've got another buddy who swears by mesquite, you know. So, um, you know, it just depends on, on, I guess, what you like. I'd love to see um, some flavor profile studies done going forward using some of these different woods to, um, you know, get a sense of, you know, what kind of flavor is added with – Actually, yeah, the, the 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 newer stuff, like you said, like cherry and and like I was talking about acacia and and mesquite and birch and and maple. They're so new that that there are some out there, but it's it's not a lot of information on it yet. Um, I, I think in the next five years, we're going to see a whole bunch more come uh, of it. But you know, the, the classic like American oak with its vanilla and coconut and cream soda. Um, you know that that that's a known. Uh, an oak flavor you're going to get from American oak, whereas in French, uh, you're going to get those more softer tannins, uh, the silkier tannins. Um, you know, the, the, they're known for you know for that as well. And European is somewhere in, in between the two of those. Um, but the you know, if you're buying an American oak barrel, you should know that you know it's going to be aggressive. It's going to be sweeter. It's going to have that vanilla and that coconut. Uh, flavor, and if you're buying a French oak barrel, you should know what you're getting into as well, especially for the price you're going to pay for a French oak barrel if it's new. Um, but yeah, I think as as this as we start to venture in wine, or we start to venture into some of these more um, yeah, the absurd uh, wood uh, wood woods like again cherry and, and acacia and, and ash, and uh, we'll start to see a lot uh, of information come from them. Um, you know, the wine industry has a lot of money. And uh, once they sink their teeth into a new style of oak, uh, they're going to do a lot of uh, a lot of research on it as well, and, and we'll start seeing some of that, which is nice. We can, we can benefit from that. Yeah, yeah, we can. Um, and, yeah, I mean, if they start branching out into that, I think that would be great. It would be really interesting to see what happens. I wonder how well that will go over with the worldwide media, uh, wine industry, you know. <laughs> I agree. It, it would be – they are starting to. Um, uh, there's a couple of those that are already starting to be used. Um, but honestly, uh, you know, in, in my time of working as a barrel broker, I, the breweries are – the brewers and breweries are more adventurous. Um, they're ready to try anything, uh, chestnut, um, you know, all these wild uh, uh, foods that are available to them that, that brewers can use and that have available to them but the wine industry might not be calling for it. But breweries now are starting to call for them um, as they realize that, there, that that option is available to them. Um, so I, I think even, you know, for some of the more unique stuff where we might see some, some research coming back from the breweries and or, or a specific breweries in, uh, in general. Um, but there's, I mean, I, I know I sold breweries uh, uh, fooders and casts that were made of, of chestnut and cherry and acacia and ash and all these unique things and they're holding beer right now if not you know already on their second or third turn oh sorry I thought I was unmuted and I wasn't um <laughs> Tells you how well my brain's been working. Um, yeah, I, the, the wine industry changes too slowly, so you know, I did. Hopefully, oh, yeah. you know, once that goes, um, who is it? Was pretty. Oh, Michael Wilson is saying Knob Creek has a bourbon where they put a maple stave in an American oak barrel. 
So they actually put a stave yep. of different wood in with the wood. So, <laughs> so that's... Yep. Uh, you, you have Jim Beam, who is using techniques where they're, you know, Jim Beam is using techniques for, uh, what is that new that new bourbon they have? Uh, uh, angels, not Angels, not me, that's the other one, but where they're basically using a vacuum to suck out of the barrel, out of the wood, all of the bourbon that, that would be, quote-unquote, stuck in the wood. Um, oh, the angel and, share, uh, yeah. How dare they? The angels angel will share. get them for that. <laughs> I know, yeah. That, that's what they're doing. They're pulling out this extremely, you know, oak tannic uh, uh, whiskey that then they're aging and putting in bottles and, and selling it. And I, I've, I've had it. It's, it's, it's unique. It's not for me. Um, I mean, imagine, imagine your classic bourbon and then add, you know, add even more oak on top of it, kind of like Woodford Reserve does. They're a double oak, where they're now they're taking the same, you know, they're using a virgin uh, white oak American barrel, and then they're aging it in another virgin white oak American barrel to even double up on the oak. Um, it, it, there's so much happening in, in, in those barrels right now, or in the, in the distilling industry, that it's fantastic. But at the same time, I think some of it becomes, there's a point where how much oak and how much wood can you have in your whiskey or your bourbon? And uh, I think we're going to find out soon as they keep with these unique techniques and trying to draw out as much as they can. Well, I can see why that would be a good thing. I still think the Angels are going to be pissed, though. No, I agree. <laughs> yeah. They're probably, they're probably, you know, some sort of disaster will happen as a result that Angels will get them back. Uh, yeah, they, they, they'll find a way. I mean, it, it, you know, it hurts the, the bigger industry because then, you know, when they start doing these techniques, there's no, there's less bourbon barrels available to the brewers. Now, again, in, in the grand scheme of things, the brewers uh, or even the brewing industry uh, is, is, you know, drops in the bucket uh, of where these barrels are, are generally going. Um, they're really going over to Scotland. They're really going over to, to Japan. Uh, where they don't have the same laws that we have and they can age their scotches or their whiskeys uh, over there in our uh, once-used bourbon barrel. Um, and, you know, they're buying up 90%, if not 95% of our barrels. Hence why Jim Beans now owned by Tenori, uh and, you know, all of our American uh, uh, distilleries are being purchased by, uh, you know, overseas companies. Yeah. Because they can set up their own their own distilleries over there, and they can age it, age their 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 bourbons here once in these barrels. And when they're done with it, they'll sell that product, and then they'll take those barrels over to their own country where the laws are different, age continuously in them uh, for for ten, fifteen, twenty years, and release it, and 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 then you know release those bottles as well, and and make even more money on it. So they see that it's a, it's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, it's a very the barrel in, the barrel market is extremely extremely interesting and it it changes monthly. It should be interesting to see. Oh, uh, Shane Coombs popped up to give us the name of the uh, bourbon we couldn't think of. The Devil's Cut. Devil's Cut. There it is. Thank yeah. you. So now yep. you'll be able to sleep tonight, Adam. Uh, no. <laughs> you'll wake up at three o'clock in the there morning going Devil's Cut. And your wife going what? Yes, <laughs> yes exactly. <laughs> I was like, no, don't worry about it. Done. It is nothing. Uh, never mind, honey. Nightmare. That's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I dreamed they bought all my barrels and I couldn't get any more. It's okay, really. <laughs> would be that would be great, but uh, I don't think it's gonna happen anytime soon. There's a lot yeah. of them out there. There is, there is, but I love how there's all this trading going on. That's really cool. So, um, what uh, you know? Give us the fifty thousand foot view of your talk. What uh, what all sure. are you going to kind of kind of touch on? Maybe give us the the Cliff Notes version. <laughs> all right. So we're going to in my speech we're going to talk a little bit about. I have a couple recommended readings. Uh, there's a couple of good books out there. There's a couple of good websites um, that we're going to discuss. Um, that I think if you're ready to get into barrel aging on a home uh, on a home level and commercial level, that you should absolutely be reading and, and get yourself uh, 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 informed with. Uh, we'll do a little barrel history. Uh, it's fun to know the barrel history and know, you know how these came about uh, and, and how we got to where we are. Um, we'll go over barrel terminology, um, like, like I was just mentioning. I think a lot of, uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there on as far as what barrel, what, what, what 
qualify as a barrel as a barrel, what qualifies a punch as a punch. When does a cask become a cask, and what is a hooter? Um, so we'll go through that. Um, we'll go through parts of the barrel. Uh, if you're going to get into barrel aging, again, uh, you need to know your barrel inside and out. Each one needs to know the terminology so that you can talk to other mead makers, other breweries, um, what it takes to make a barrel, uh, cooperaging. Um, we'll go through barrel selection. Um, we'll talk about some species of, of wood that you can get. Um, and then we're going to get into, like, what's right for you. Like, all right, so you're a home mead maker. You're a, a commercial uh, meadery. Um, what's going to fit for you? Is, is one barrel going to be good for your meadery at this time? Uh, is a 500-liter punching going to be what you're looking for? Is two 500-liter punchings? Or maybe you're going to be looking for, a, a, you know, a 12-hectoliter fooder or cask um, if you're a larger meadery. Um, We'll go through benefits of used vessels. Um, you know, what, what, what is the, what's the upside of, of a used vessel of buying a bourbon barrel or a red wine barrel or a, or a gin barrel? Um, and what are, what are the disadvantages of those? What, what are some issues you should be prepared to uh, uh, incorporate? Uh, or what, what, what issues should you be ready to, to handle? Um, we'll talk about new oak as well. What are the advantages and disadvantages of oak, uh, of new oak? Um, we'll go then quickly into oak alternatives and talk about them. There's so many, and it's an ever-changing market. Um, so by the time I've already written this speech, and by the time I give it in a couple weeks, it'll probably almost be out of date, um, as they're always coming up with something new. Um, we'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of barrel alternatives. Um, you know, using uh, using uh, oak rice or oak chips in in primary, uh, using it in secondary, using it in post fermentation, and using it uh, for you know cellaring. Um, and then we'll go into some talk again about if you're going to be home, a home uh, mead maker and you have a 15 gallon barrel at home or you have a 10 gallon barrel at home. Um, if you if you run into issues with that barrel, how can you fix it? Uh, if your barrel is leaking uh, or if it, you know you bought a barrel from a, a homebrew shop and you get it home and it's super dry, how can you remedy that? How can you fix that? Um, we'll go over that, and that will also play into commercial. Um, how, how can how can commercial meteries, um make sure the barrels they're buying are, uh, are, are what they should expect? Um, that they're not buying a, you know a two hundred dollar barrel and they're getting one that should be used for planters. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then bar uh, barrel preparation. So just throw that out there. Barrel preparation. So now you have this beautiful barrel that you just dropped to $150 up to $1,200, depending on what size it is and depending on what it is. You have this barrel. What do you do with it, and how do you prepare it to be ready for your mead um, so that you're not going to put it in there and it'll be ruined? Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we'll talk about wood storage, cellaring, um, you know, what are, what are some proper uh, uh, proper conditions for your for your seller um, you know uh, dealing in the in the brokerage in the barrel brokerage world I can tell you that one of the most important important parts of either whether it's home need making uh, and you have two 15 gallon barrels in your basin uh, or you're a commercial meadery and you have 50 uh, you know 53 gallon um, bourbon barrels uh, if your cellar conditions are not correct, you will have nothing but problems. Um, and and it's, it's not hard to control those, but it's good to know what those conditions are and how to keep those barrels happy, if you will. Um, and, and from there after that, we're going to do Q&A, which is always my favorite part of it because I get all sorts of fun questions. And uh, that's always my favorite part. I like at least answering questions and talking with people and, and directly answering some questions. So. Uh, that's pretty much a, a quick rundown of what we're going to do. Uh, you all heard it here first. Um, there's going to be uh, a lot going on, uh, and he's going to be cramming a lot of information into a short period of time. So um, <laughs> yeah. you want to be there if you can. Uh, if you can't, we're going to be videoing all of the talks, so you'll have the opportunity to purchase those. You can either purchase the whole thing or uh, – um, either the whole thing now or uh, we're going to be offering just, well we have just home and just pro now and then we're also going to be offering individual ones later so um, 
you know, if if you can't make it for whatever reason, although I recommend that you do because not only is there Adam, there's 20 other speakers on subjects ranging, well, over everything, both home and pro. We've got a trade show. We've got breakout sessions. And um, plus there's the epic parties that happen in the evening. So <laughs> it's – There are some epic parties. Oh, there are some sure. seriously epic parties, yeah. And uh, you're not going to get the opportunity to meet a more concentrated collection of amazing mead makers anywhere, anytime than you do at uh, I can this... I can only contest to that. I mean, even for myself, there are so many seminars that I am I am just so excited to sit in and, and listen and learn and it's it's gonna be awesome. So yeah, every everyone should be there or coming or finding a way there. And if, if you can't then you definitely should be purchasing because it's uh, there's gonna be a lot of information thrown around in a in a short period of time. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh we're really pleased with the the lineup this year is great and it's only gonna get better. You know, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, it's, it's getting to the point now where I actually had to turn people away for speakers this year because we ran out of spots, you know, so it, wow. yeah, and, and last year it was like, please speak at the conference, you know, I was begging people, so <laughs> this year it was like, that's I'm a, really that's sorry. That's a good position to be in. It is a good position to be in, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm really, I'm really happy about it. It's, uh, you know, that means that, you know, it's starting to pick up, so. Um, you know, I mean, there are still tickets available. Go to meet-makers.org and just put your mouse over 2018 conference and you'll see the drop down for registration and, um, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. The conference itself is fairly inexpensive. I know that traveling to Colorado might be uh, a little bit pricier, but a whole bunch of us drop a whole bunch of money every year going out there and it's always worth it. Always, always, always. Um, <laughs> AJ just asked if there was a cork just popped. <laughs> Was yeah, this, this, this will be my this will be my second year, and and after after last year being my first, there's, there's no way I'm missing it uh, yeah. again. There's, there's no way. It, it's fantastic, and it, you know, I think that first time you're there, it's it's it, it, it's amazing. Just meeting everybody, the the you know the vibe of the whole of the whole conference is fantastic. It's, Absolutely, uh, I'm, I'm I feel the same way. Back there again. Yeah. It's uh, I had to, I had to I had to bug the crap out of AJ, but I don't think she regretted coming out, even though even though it kind of strained her vacation budget a little bit. But yeah, <laughs> we made it work. We made it work, and um, <clears throat> you know, and she was actually able to get away from work, which kind of surprised me. <laughs> well, I just left my husband with all the work. Well, there you go. Yeah, that's true. the advantage of working as a team. <laughs> that's very true. That's very true. But, uh, yeah, the day will come when he's like, honey, I'm off to Iceland for two weeks. Bye. You know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, it was, favor. There, was, there was a lot. There was a lot going on, and I think there's going to be a lot more going on. We've got a whole bunch of vendors, including uh, Scott Labs, and um, Universal Packaging is going to be there. And, uh, oh, gosh, I think I, I could run down the list if I was looking at it, but my brain is broke. So... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I will have at least uh, with my at this moment. I have one confirmed Cooperage that I worked with at my previous job, who will be sending me with a bunch of of samples uh, oh, for cool. people to take home nice. as well. So there will be there will be different oaks uh, uh, oh, that cool. you can take home and do some test batching with. So they have confirmed it with a whole bunch of uh, uh, you know uh, brochures and all the stuff that they're sending to me that I'm just waiting to get uh, that I will make sure I have with me. All so right. that should be great for people after it to take it home and do their own little testing and have some fun with it. Cool. That is really cool. So, yeah, if you're you're not going to get that if you're just watching the video, guys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you have to be there if you want to get one of these from Adam. So, um, you know, there's – and that's just – I mean, we've got like half a dozen – sessions where there's going to be tastings of varietal honeys of meads made from varietal honeys of um where you and i need to talk to see if we can work that out with your stuff uh adam and um you know and just there's there's half a dozen where you actually are going to get hands on there's a sour mead tasting when carolyn people who was on last week is going to be doing and there's 13 sour meads um yeah that she's going to be letting everybody taste and review. So you're going to be like judging them basically, um, you know, right there in the, in the, in the, uh, 
in the session. So um, there's, yeah, it's going to be a, it's going to be great. And, and, you know, and I'm like sitting here going crap and I'm probably not going to get to see hardly any of them because I'm going to be running around making sure everything's working. So, <laughs> so yeah, save me I, one I of those oak packets, it. Adam, because I probably won't get to see your talk until after I'll, the I'll fact. I'll pull them aside. Yeah. I, I keep looking at the list myself and I'm like, man, there's just, uh, you need to choose between certain ones oh, and, and decide which one do you want to go to between, like you said, like the pro and the home. And I, I want to go to them all. But, yeah. like, it, yeah. it's, it's, it's going to be last-minute decisions, I think, on which one I'm going to go to myself when, when I'm not uh, doing something else. But, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I'm really yeah. excited. It's going to be pretty cool. So, yeah, it's uh, I'm, I'm excited about it. I just got to finish getting all my little chores done so I have it all ready to go. Mm-hmm. So much stuff. So. That's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm putting in, like, uh, yeah, 10-hour days right Same now for here, like two yeah. weeks till we go. So I can be there and not have to worry about anything. Everything needs to be moved through out of fermenters into stainless and or into kegs or bottles, and I'm trying to move everything as quickly as I can. And, uh, yeah, days days are days are long days of the meter right now so that I can just go there and enjoy myself for, for that week and not have to really worry about anything, which will be fantastic. I get to that place the uh, at 510 on Thursday. <laughs> When yeah, when, okay. when, the, when the last conference session is over, I was like, "Somebody hand me a glass of mead." <laughs> yeah, okay. Come come find me, and I'll, uh, I'll I'll either make sure that uh, you, uh, I'll get your first glass of mead, or we'll go to the bar, we'll get a beer, and or or I mean, depending on how how insane it was, a whiskey or or a bourbon. So it'd probably you know, be yeah, it'll probably be like it. a glass of scotch and a hamburger at that point because I'm not even sure <laughs> yeah, time to bad. eat. Yeah. 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 So uh, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be good though, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to it. So it's gonna be it's gonna be fun, and I'm gonna try not to be as crazy this year as I was last year. <laughs> yeah, bullshit. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, well, we'll I see have, how that goes. I have more minions <laughs> this year. Last year was just me and AJ and Hamish and uh, and 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 Robert. Um, and uh, and Bruce, poor Bruce, <laughs> didn't even know what mean was when he came. But boy, he sure got an education. Um, but um, yeah, I just you know I just had uh, my gang guess you know basically, and those poor guys never even got to see any of it. So this year it's going to be different. I've got I've got about twenty people that are going to be manning tables, doing counting at the doors to make sure the rooms aren't overloaded, uh, running the running the um, overheads so that the presentation. I got one guy. He's like. I'm just, he says, I'm a metery in, in planning. Would you mind if I just ran the projector for like both days of, uh, the pro thing? And so I can be uh, in all of them. And I said, no, thank you. <laughs> you know? That's great. Yeah. So he's like, I'll just sit there and change slides and take notes, man. I'm, I'm, I'm like totally up I'm down for that. So yeah, it's, uh, you know, I've got some really enthusiastic volunteers that uh, shout out to all the awesome people who volunteered who are still waiting for me to give them their final assignments. I know, I know, I know. I haven't forgotten you. I'm madly trying to get it all done. Um, and, uh, you know, who are going to be handling a lot of the stuff that, that just the four of us had to juggle last year. So, um, and yeah. everybody, even, you know, the volunteers are all going to get ample time to see is, you know, quite a bit of the conference. So it's, it's going to be cool. As long as I don't forget anything, like, vital. <laughs> <laughs> I know the food's going to be good at the Wednesday night. I just got done sending a list of the hotel today, so. Um, there you go. Yeah. It's coming together, slowly but surely, one one little task at a time. But, um, well, <laughs> yeah. Thanks for coming on, Adam. It's going to be fun to see you again yeah. in a couple of weeks. No problem. I'm, I am, I said, I'm excited to be out there and see everyone again and uh, and just spend some time with uh, with all different mead makers and, and from all over the U.S. It's such an awesome get-together, so I'm, uh, I'm anxiously awaiting it, that's for sure. Yeah, it's going to be good. So, all right, well, we'll let you get back to uh, your life and your wife. and um, It's going to be sleep. Yeah, That's and the sleep thing, yeah, the same here. I'm going to yeah. try to get my ass in gear early tomorrow so I can get more done. But, um, you know, meanwhile, we'll see you soon. And uh, those Cheers. of you out there who are listening, if you haven't got your tickets yet, go get your tickets. <laughs> Me-makers.org. You're almost out of time. Uh, oh, uh, David's asking if you guys sell online. Are you on Vina Shipper? Uh, we are not, but we will be, uh, let's say, in the next, month month and a half we're waiting for a federal uh, uh approval for a wholesaler's license oh, nice. uh once we are then we'll be up so there's those uh, damn pennsylvania laws not. again <laughs> yes yes uh it it 
It could be, uh, I mean, listen, it could be next week. And the minute I get back from the federal, I'll be all over it. Um, it could and you be guys week, will hear him three, cheering but, all but over we Facebook, I'm sure. <laughs> Yay! Yeah, we, we, are, <laughs> we are very, very, very excited to be up there. Uh, I've been in contact with them. They are anxiously awaiting us as well. We have everything in place to go. It's just a matter of getting that, getting that final from the federal. So uh, once it happens, we will. And, cool. yeah, we'll have all of our meets up there, which will be great. Awesome. Yeah, let me know when. I want some too. So uh, I guess I, I guess yeah. I just need to come up to PA and help you guys. Uh, you know, go visit all the meteorologists. There are a lot you of guys us. Are all organizing. Yeah, there are a lot yeah. of us. Yeah, we yeah. need to talk. And we need to talk about coming. that offline. There's some things that uh, I think that that may be able to happen that will help you guys too. So we'll talk about it offline. Cool. But um, I love it. Yeah, some stuff that Bobby and I came up with over the weekend while I was lurking in New York. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, David I Webb says I mean, he yeah, wants to try your mead, so you'll have to let him know as soon as you guys are. <laughs> we, we, it, it will be announced loud and clear on every every channel I can because we'll be excited about it as well to be able to, to get it out there and be able to ship it to everybody. So yeah, it'll happen. I would say, and I'd say at the worst case in the next month and a half, but uh, hopefully it'll be quicker than that. Yeah, and Joe Abruzzo says, well, he was just there today anyway, so. <laughs> he was, yeah. 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 We we are we are very excited to have it up and it was it was awesome so yeah. That's cool. All right then. So uh, yeah, bring some samples because I love to try your stuff. I don't think I've had it yet. And um, yeah, yeah. we're we're gonna I'm bringing I'm shipping a case out at least a case if not more uh, next week so it'll be are out you, there waiting for me. Are you pouring it the uh, Wednesday night? I can't remember. I haven't got the sheet in front of me. I am not. No, it Do just you... it wasn't gonna happen between everything that was going on. I'm not even getting out there until. Tuesday, like late, like I, I leave, I leave Pennsylvania at six o'clock, so I'm not landing until ten o'clock. And oh, no, 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 by the time no. I get in, and, and but say if you off. want your stuff poured at the Wednesday night uh, meet and greet, that's the AMMA event. Mm -hmm. All you have to do mm -hmm. is provide six bottles and a zero invoice, and the hotel does all the work. All you have to do is just be there. <laughs> oh, that's not bad. No, okay. not at all. Well, yeah, may, maybe. A yeah, drop me a line. You Maybe got I'll send email. you a quick. Yeah, I will. I'll send you an email with the details on that. But that sounds interesting. I'm all about that. Yeah, get your meat in front of people. Um, we pay for bartenders. Hotel bartenders do the pouring, cool. and it's just an evening. Uh, it's just a, they pour meat, and there's and there's hors d'oeuvres, and you know, I mean, it's it's just a just a casual sort of everybody kind of gets together network sort of thing. Sounds great. I'll send you an email about it tomorrow, and I'll get all the details. All right, thanks, man. Appreciate it. And, yeah, um, you got right. it. All right, so go to bed, and uh, you know you got ten hour days to work. You and you and me both, and I'll see you in <laughs> in uh, what fourteen, twelve something days. I don't know. I can't keep track anymore. Not far away. For me, for me, it's all. like just not even two weeks, like a week and a half. I'm going on Monday, so. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So, all right, man. Um, see you later, and um, definitely see you later. Uh, don't forget to email me. Okay? Cheers, guys. Cheers. Thank you very much. All right. Take night, care. Adam. Good night. That was a good show tonight, man. Mm -hmm. A really good show. Oh, you, can you hear the puppies of the apocalypse whining? Yes, because yes. They can tell by the tone, and I, I keep tone hearing... of voice that we're almost done here. Yeah. Um, for those of you that are wondering, hear somebody shake. Yeah, the puppies of the apocalypse uh, don't have uh, supervision tonight because their dad is in Boston. So they're in here in the office with me, and they're all whining and crying because they know what time it is. They have these little doggy watches that they wear. Um, and uh, <laughs> certain things happen at certain times of the night that involve C O O K I E S S, and I'm not going to say it because they'll hear me. Um, all right, so but they haven't figured out how to spell that yet. Uh, well, sometimes they they're not paying attention enough, so uh, yeah, okay. they have to sort of puzzle it out, you know. Um, right. Yeah, it was a uh, the saying is a great show. It was a great show. Mm -hmm. Chris, Chris Kristen cracks me up. Um, totally. Yeah. Okay. So. Can't wait to meet him in person. <laughs> I know, right? I, it's like he talks so fast. I get tired just listening to him. You know? <laughs> I was just like, "What? What'd you just say? It went past me so fast. I didn't catch that." Um, all right. So, uh, upcoming events: March 14th and 15th, of course, is the AMMA Meet Conference. With, if you are a member of the AMMA and you can become one for as little as thirty dollars, if you're a home meat maker. Um, uh, the AMMA members meeting is on uh, uh, March 13th from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. local time in Colorado. Uh, 14th and 15th from 8.30 in the morning till 5 in the afternoon is the AMMA Mead Conference. Two tracks, two days with breakout sessions on Thursday. And uh, there's also a trade show going on March 16th and 17th. Same location in Broomfield, Colorado. Mazer Cup International, world's largest mead competition. And on Friday night... 
Uh, from 7 to 10, I believe it is. This is the Mead Mixer, the world's largest public mead tasting. There's there's like 70 meaderies or something like that. It's just ridiculous amount of mead being poured at this thing. Um, I mean, Crazy. just an utterly ridiculous amount of mead. And thanks to Carvin Wilson, there's like twice the number of meaderies all sharing tables and and helping their a lot of the littler <laughs> meaderies are getting their mead poured and, and they can you know a lot of people can thank Carvin for that he did a great job. Uh, March 31st, day of the Juice Beer Festival, um, and then April 21st, uh, Winemaker Shop Mead Competition. All this stuff is linked on the show page and uh, will always be there. Upcoming, uh, not a damn thing. We are off next week, and uh, we are off the week of the AMMA Conference and the Mazer Cup. However, we will be doing a uh, a uh, live broadcast from the Mead Mixer on Friday night, and I don't know exactly what time we'll pick that up yet, but we will be posting something about it. So just keep your eyes peeled, and you'll get to, even if you don't get to come, you can at least get to sort of enjoy the Mead Mixer vicariously. We'll tease you with meats. Um, so, uh, you know, it'll, it'll be an interesting show. It's more going to be just checking in to see what people are doing and what's being poured and all that kind of thing, letting people talk about their meads and, and what they like. So, um, that'll be our broadcast for that week. And then, uh, we'll be back the week after that, probably with a major cup and uh, uh, conference recap and to, you know, we'll get a bunch of people on to talk about that. Done, you know, tell us what they saw, what they liked, what they didn't like, that kind of thing. So, uh, that's all I got. What about you? I got nothing. Okay. All right. Well, then say goodnight, Gracie. Goodnight, Gracie. All right, y'all. See you in a couple. (laughs) And, uh, you know, get out there, drink some good mead, and hopefully we'll see some or all of you at the AMMA Conference and Mazer Cup International. Uh, Good night, all. Night, everybody.